Music for the Masses. Headline of this new July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Welcome, Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. Uh, yeah. How you doing? How you doing? It's Monday, October first. 2018, 277 days into the new year, just 88 days left. As always, we are live. We are live from a bunker somewhere in the middle of beautiful downtown Burbank, California. And I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planets. I am your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? How you doing? That's right, it's October 1st, and tonight... Tonight we have a very special guest with us. Jim Breslow is here, host of the Hidden Truth Show. And he joins us one year after the Las Vegas shooting. And we're going to find out what really happened on October 1st, 2017. Man, I can't even believe it's been a year. And if you think about it, and all the coverage that we did here on on Fade to Black and, and all of the media around the world and... And lack of it too, as well. It's it's really hard to believe that it's it's been a it's been a year. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. So we're going to do a full show on that tonight. Las Vegas, one year later, tomorrow night, Chance Gardner is here, and we're going to talk about the Magical Egypt Online Symposium, which kicked off today all around the world. And uh, on Wednesday, I'm going to be on the symposium. That's right. So tomorrow night, Chance will be here. And then on Wednesday, uh, Chance and I will be uh, hosting, uh, and I'll be the guest, uh, one of the presenters uh, for the Magical Egypt Online Symposium. That'll be on Wednesday. Also tomorrow night, joining us at the top of the show, I'm so excited about this, Graham Bonnet guitarist, Kurt James is going to stop by. They are in the middle of a tour, and uh, they are heading out the next morning. Uh, I don't want to give away too much. but So he's going to stop by tomorrow night, and I can't wait. Also, uh, one of the things that's going down tomorrow night is uh, Graham Bonnet's new video will make its world premiere tomorrow night, too, as well. So... Kurt James is going to stop by, and he is, he is the paranormal guitar player. That's right. Really cool dude, too. He, he's an amazing player, but what a great guy, and he's going to be with us tomorrow night, so I'm excited about that. And then Wednesday, uh, yes, that's right, that's what we're doing Wednesday, Wednesday night, there is a new 20 and back insider and his name is jason rice uh his uh first interview on cosmic disclosure with jay widener premiered last week on gaia tv 
his next uh, interview, I believe, will be tomorrow night. That'll uh, make its way online tomorrow night via Gaia. And that will be tomorrow. And Wednesday night, Jason Rice will be here on Fade to Black. Uh, now, this is uh, an exclusive interview, and we've uh, got Jason here. And so he's making his his worldwide radio and television <laughs> debut here on Fade to Black on Wednesday night. Now, I know there's a lot of anticipation behind this show, and I get that, and I fully understand the reasons why. But uh, there's always somebody's first show, and it will be uh, right here on Fade to Black on Wednesday night for Jason Rice. So I know everybody's going to be tuning in for that. So, uh, again, another amazing week here on Fade to Black. Thursday night is another Fader night with open lines all night long. John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom live and you've got all of the call-in numbers, 323-825-5045 or 323-275-9695 or 818-921-6929. As everybody knows, I'm a big social media guy. Did a little social media over the weekend. You can find us everywhere uh, on Stellar.com. That is our social media platform of choice on Stellar.com. O-N-S-T-E-L-L-A-R.com. You can go and hang out with us over there. Of course, Twitter is at J Church Radio. Facebook is whatever. And, of course, YouTube as well. And there you go. Now, oh, I wanted to announce um, we have a... About 300, 250 or so, maybe 300 shows on video that we've never posted. Okay? And the recordings are just sitting there uh, hidden on YouTube. So over the weekend, we kind of went back and we're like, wow, you know, there's all of these shows just sitting there that nobody's ever seen. You've heard them, but some people have never seen them so we just went through and and just merely clicked on you know the the check marks the boxes and unhid the videos and it's it's really kind of funny because they never they only had one view right and the one view was the bunker cam and that's it so they're just sitting there so you know it's been it's been a while so we just Kind of went back and unhid, going in order. I think we probably did 25 over the weekend. And and the reactions from everybody, well, this is, uh, you know, this is nine weeks old and, and no views. Well, <laughs> it's, just, it's just so funny. But anyway, that's what that is. And uh, if you're going to be listening to this show later or tomorrow or whatever on YouTube, uh, hopefully that will explain and uh, you know the confusion. It's just a matter of uh, they were just hidden and they still are. We've got uh, tons. I mean, it goes back. You gotta you gotta remember how many shows that we do in a year, and there's probably I don't know two hundred fifty three hundred shows that are just sitting there. So we're gonna just for archives' sake, and some people uh, will get a kick out of it, and some of the shows are are pretty funny with their mistakes and and the, especially the early ones with video. So they're they're all there and we'll eventually it takes a lot of time to do it to prep it and and get it ready, but it's not as simple as just clicking by the way. But um we're going to go back and and slowly release the videos and we'll go backwards searching through uh our archives and trying to find the first show. That's hard. So we'll, um, uh, you know, the first show that we started running video on. And so we're actually going to go from the newest to the oldest. And we'll, we'll eventually get there. But so for everybody out there, you can go back and, and see the shows that you never saw live on video. I don't know why people enjoy watching a dude speak into a microphone by himself in a bunker underground in a dark room. Uh, but... I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, so we'll just release it so everybody has it. Okay? It's really that simple. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox. It's where we hang out. Are you ready for a new internet? I did see that. Yes. Berners-Lee is uh, 
uh, coming out with a new internet. That's actually uh, pretty cool. And and his take on it, he's not going to do the same old, same old. I mean, he's put a lot of thought into this, and this isn't the first time he's attempted a new internet either. But yeah, that's if if he it's already done, by the way. Um, but if it grabs hold, that's the thing. If it grabs hold of everybody, that would be really cool. That would be uh, pretty amazing. A decentralized Internet. Oh, that's what we were supposed to have the first time around. Right? <laughs> yeah, did you hear about California? California passed a bill. There's uh, We have our own net neutrality over here. Ha, 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 ha. Ah, see, now this is the deal, man. Uh, I, I got a lot to get to tonight, but let me just say this. Um, California, as crazy as it is out here, and I know it's it's nuts, and I know we have a, a crazy governor and, and Brown and, and all of that, and that we're just, you know, we're just a little off center out here. We're just strange. Well, okay. You know, but we did give you skateboards, right? So just don't forget about that. Um, but anyway... All of, gave you Van Halen, all of the crazy stuff seems to happen out here first. And when it comes to net neutrality, when when Congress and the Senate and Trump decided to uh, push that through, I had said then, I was very concerned, I don't want people in control of the net. I don't want people in control of me. I don't want people throttling back this show. I don't want the Internet pipelines choked down. I don't want you to have uh, uh, buffering in your video or your Internet or your streaming or anything, right? Or or you have to pay for it. You know, oh, oh, it's buffering. Oh, you got to pay more because some Internet provider is now in control of it. Well, that's what was just passed out here. That that That's the one thing I can say about California when it comes to stuff like this. You know, we're not going to have our Internet throttled out here. We don't have to pay extra to have the same Internet speeds as everybody else. And everything is going to come to us at the same rate of speed. That's it. You know, and that's a good thing. I don't care what people want to say that it's competition and, you know, it, it's going to be fair. It's going to be cool. No, you don't want people in control of your Internet. It's just everybody's gets gets the same slice of the pie. That's the way it should be. And the little guy and the big guy have the same speeds. And, and that's it. That's it. <sighs> Governor Jerry Brown. Strange dude, but I'm happy he did that. All right. You can email throughout the show, jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. We have breaking news today. Investors cheered today because Elon Musk, and you read about it over the weekend, struck a deal with the SEC that he's got to step down as chairman of the board of, of Tesla and pay a $20 million fine. And so does Tesla, too. Tesla, the company, and Elon Musk both had to pay $20 million each. The stock surged 17% today, wiping out Friday's loss. Over the weekend, Musk agreed to a settlement with the SEC that requires him to step down as Tesla's chairman and pay that $20 million fine. Why? Because he made some profits. Yeah, he lied. But anyway, he tweeted out something that wasn't wasn't totally true. And under the settlement, which requires court approval, by the way, Musk will be allowed to stay on as CEO, but he must leave his role as chairman of the board within 45 days. He cannot seek re-election for three years, according to these court filings. Also over the weekend, and this just underneath the radar, it's weird. I haven't seen it anywhere in, in any of the news, any of the mass media that there's another law that was just passed here in California. I believe it passed, which is that all publicly traded companies have to have a woman on their boards. And I thought to myself, isn't is has wasn't that already a law or even ethically shouldn't but I I, I forget the number, but there is a huge percentage of all male boards here in in California and I didn't realize that you know the boys club 
So there you go. I mean, California, you know, always progressive, but uh, staying in front of the game here on a couple of very important matters. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. It's only $2 a month, our podcast, where we have almost a 1,000 archive shows, right, just sitting there. I don't know, 925 shows. Just $2 per month. You got all the apps that you need. Every platform, just click on the banner, the podcast banner over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. You can also become a fade or not in our membership section of the site. And do you have your fade or not gear? Post the pictures. Once you get the autographed shirts and hats, post the pictures. Okay, we've got, I've saved everything. I have so many, I have no idea. I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures. And I think we should have a fade or not section on the website. So I'm ready to go with it. Post the pictures. I save them all. And I, I think we should get that going. I'm going to get that over to Drew. I think we should have a fade or not, fade or not gear section of the website and, you know, a Hall of Fame. We're going to get that going. Got to. Let's get this show cracking. Happy birthday to today. One of my favorites, Zach Galifianakis. Today is 49 years old. Our dead guy's birthday today, Richard Harris, 1930 to 2002, died at the age of 72, played Dumbledore in the first two Harry Potter films, played Marcus Aurelius in Gladiator. Yeah. Didn't, wait a minute, didn't... Uh, he gets killed, right, in the opening scene? <laughs> Isn't that how that played out? He also played King Arthur in one of the great films, 1980, uh, 1967's Camelot. On this day in history, yeah, that's right, it's October 1st, 2017. On this day, Stephen Paddock, 64-year-old retired man who lived in Mesquite, Nevada, Targeted crowd of concert goers on the Las Vegas Strip from the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Hotel, killing 58 people and injuring more than 800. Fader fact. Okay, here you go. Fader fact. Portland was named by a coin flip. That's right. Had the coin landed on the other side. The city would be named Boston, Oregon. And that, that's a fader fact. That's a trip, isn't it? You know, that's one of those facts. You just got to sit back for about a minute or two and just ponder that. Boston, Oregon. And it was 50-50. It was 50-50. Tonight, very special guest Jim Breslow is here. He is the host of the Hidden Truth Show. He joins us one year after the Las Vegas shooting. That's right. Today is October 1st. And we're going to discuss what really happened uh, that very, very insane night back in 2017. Tomorrow night, Chance Gardner is here. We're going to talk about the Magical Egypt Online Symposium that kicked off today. Almost two straight weeks of Egypt knowledge is going down right now. And also tomorrow night, Graham Bonnet guitarist Kurt James is going to stop by. I cannot wait for that. And then Wednesday night, we have a new 20 back, uh, twenty and back insider. His name is Jason Rice, and he will be here for a very, very exclusive Fade to Black evening. Thursday is another Fader night with open lines all night long. John Rappaport's going to be here with his No More Fake Newsroom Live. And with that, I'm going to hit my fade to black blend coffee. Thank you, River Moon Coffee. Go to the River Moon Coffee banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B Blend. There you go. All right. Mm. Absolutely the best coffee in the world right there. Fade to black blend. Okay. The Las Vegas shooting. When that went down, we got a text from Las Vegas. And Rita and I were on our patio. Okay? We're on the patio. And this text came in from Las Vegas. There's a shooting going on right now here. 
machine gun fire in the streets of Vegas. And that was the text. I'll never forget it. In the streets of Vegas. So Rita and I get up. There's nothing on on the news yet. We get up uh, and rush into the house, get get the TVs on, and we're reverting back to our text and our friend, and we were asking them about what was going on. And after a couple of minutes, uh, everything flipped over to Las Vegas, and I'm talking about all the media outlets, and we watched it play out live on television just like everybody else. We stayed up all night long. We had our laptops, we had tablets, we had our cell phones, we had the TV, and uh, between the two of us, we probably had six or eight media sources all playing out live in in front of us, trying to get to the bottom of what was happening out there. And I don't like when things like this break. I mean, of course, how can you, right? But my point being is that it was tough. It was tough for us to watch. It was an incredible story that was breaking. And our job, uh, not only in, in doing Fade to Black, but being journalists and, and, and staying out in front of this and, and trying to uh, get to the real news, that's what we do. And, and we watched it. The, the way that it ultimately ended up unfolding started that night it started that night and what i mean by that is the las vegas police department the law enforcement in las vegas from the word go were not giving us the real information and everybody knew that the news media knew it you knew it i knew it everybody saw what was happening And it was a pretty incredible thing to see because when you have that many people in one of the most popular cities in the world, in Las Vegas, that are at a concert and something like this happens, you would think from that point that law enforcement would be very forthcoming with information and keeping us informed. And and they chose not to. Now, we're going to be just discussing all of that later on tonight, but some very fascinating things happened because of this. First off, and especially back then, a year ago, headlines, the news, was out of control. You think it's out of control today? You think media is out of control today? If you go back a year ago to when the Las Vegas shooting happened, we had all kinds of things that were going on at the same time. And then this happened. The headlines were getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And leading up to this, man, we had hurricanes and we had weather and th- we had stuff going on all over. And then Las Vegas, right? And, and through all of that, all of us had to try to find the truth. And now comes Facebook, coupled with the real police story that was playing out in the press conferences. We had eyewitnesses um, in Las Vegas. We had everything that was playing out in social media. And the press conferences that were happening in, happening in Las Vegas with the lack of information. And it just seems that we were being forced into our own news, social media, and the shooting. You need to think about that because we had people that were there. We had people that were in the casinos. We had people that were at the concert. We had people that were on the strip. We had people with cell phone footage and eyewitness testimony. All of this made its way into the social media platforms out there. Mass media didn't have a choice. They only had the information that was coming from the press conferences. And we had things that were surfacing quickly. We had helicopters that appeared to be shooting with machine gun fire. We had different windows that were shot out and 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 broken in the Mandalay Bay. All over. So we didn't know what floors the shooting had happened from. We didn't. 
And the police weren't telling us anything. We had no timeline of events. Remember that. The lack of information. And so what ended up happening? We had timeline videos that were synced up all over YouTube. And this is where it got nuts. YouTube and many of the changes in YouTube that we see today started with the Las Vegas shooting information that spread on the platform. That's right. The censorship that we see today on YouTube started back with the Las Vegas shooting. And all of, not all, but the majority of the information that we were getting that was spreading all over mass media, all around the world, on online forums with CNN and Fox and and RT and BBC, you pick it, was because they were getting their information off of YouTube because they weren't getting it from the police. And the lack of police information was the cause of what happened on YouTube. And I'll say this, not, not many will come out and in, in, in admit to the real truth about what happened. You need to think about the timeline of events. So, with the cell phone footage, with everything that was compiled from different media outlets, with eyewitness testimony, we decided to, when I say we, I'm talking about the fringe and the alternative media out there, we turned to YouTube to get the information out because the Las Vegas police decided, and the feds decided not to give us information via the press conferences. And we knew this. We knew that they were, they were choking back. And to this day, they hold back all of that critical information. And so, with everything that was happening on YouTube and the lack of uh, information, some of the YouTube uh, information was incredible. Some of it was completely fabricated. Some of it was hoaxed. Some of it was spot on the money. And YouTube chose to start censoring. And all of it happened because of the Las Vegas shooting. Today, one year later, where are we on all of this? We need to get to the real information. Our guest tonight is Jim Breslow. And with Jim, we will get to everything when it comes to the Las Vegas shooting. I am going to take a break right here. And when I come back, we will be joined by our guest, Jim Breslow, host of The Hidden Truth Show. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. You can follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. You can follow our guest tonight, Jim Breslow, at Hidden Truth Show on Twitter. Email is jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. One year after the Las Vegas shooting, October 1st, 2017, we have come a long way. And still, we know nothing. I'll be right back. Stay with us after this short break. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you-know-who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fate to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark. 
deep with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Times are changing. The circus of politics, health care's low standards and high prices, and let's not forget food quality. What to do? Arm yourself with Life Change Tea at GetTheTea.com. In a world of chemical imbalance and poor air and water quality, it's time you make a move. Log on to GetTheTea.com and stock up on organic non-GMO supplements. Don't forget the tea. Cleansing your body never felt so good. And we have a brand new tea called Takedown Tea, which helps support healthy glucose. All natural body support so you can be at your best naturally. All you have to do is log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. We're not a fad that comes and goes. We are the real deal. Join us and armor up. GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Changing America's health one tea bag at a time. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Do you want to lose weight but have no idea where to begin? The Fast Start Diet, a three-day weight loss plan, is the answer. Three days of nutritionally balanced, calorie-restricted meals delivered right to your door. No shopping, no measuring, and no cooking. Everything is prepared for you and ready to eat at home or on the go. The Fast Start Diet has all the amazing benefits of intermittent fasting without starving. We've helped thousands of people who have struggled to reach their weight loss goals. Isn't it time we helped you? With the Fast Start Diet, you'll lose weight and feel great. Find Fast Start Diet on Amazon or go to FastStartDiet.com and use promo code TALK to get 10% off your first box. And as a special bonus, Fast Start will include their number one rated LiPo3 appetite suppressant spray free with your order. This is Jimmy Church. And whatever your diet plans are, do what I did. Go to FastStartDiet.com. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Matthews, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Monday. Monday, October 1st. Wow, we've got a great week lined up here. Tonight, Jim Breslow is here, uh, one year after the Las Vegas shooting. Tomorrow night, Chance Gardner. That's right. His online symposium is going on for the next two weeks. I'll be a guest on Wednesday. He's going to be here with us tomorrow night. We'll be discussing Magical Egypt. That's tomorrow night. Wednesday night, a new whistleblower, 20 and back, has surfaced. His name is Jason Rice. His first uh, episode of Cosmic Disclosure premiered last week on Gaia. The next episode will be tomorrow, Wednesday night. That's right, Jason Rice will be here. That is an exclusive here on Fade to Black, and I know all of you uh, were expecting this, and we're going to do that on Wednesday night, so get ready for that. Thursday night is Open Lines, Fader Night. John Rappaport will be here with his No More Fake News Room Live. And then the good news is this weekend, I have off. I have off. No coast to coast this weekend. That'll be uh, the week after. Tonight, it is October 1st. It is the one-year anniversary of the Las Vegas shooting. And our guest is Jim Breslow. He's host of the Hidden Truth Show. And he's been researching the shooting since its beginning. And he's the one person that the media, including uh, HLN, Fox, and CRTV, National Radio, 
all turn to for the inside information on the biggest mass shooting in U.S. history. Jim is a former civil rights attorney, public company president, and radio broadcaster. He hosted the Jim Breslow Show late nights on KRLA 870 right here in Los Angeles, California, and Casino Talk with Louis Anderson on weekends on 97.1 Free FM, also here in Los Angeles. He was a partner at the international law firm Safarth Shaw, defending companies and individuals against alleged civil rights violations. He left the firm to become president of Diamond Game, a publicly traded gaming company which provides lottery machines and tickets to numerous state lotteries in the United States and Canada. Jim is the author of 12 patented inventions in the gaming space, and he graduated cum laude from the University of California, Irvine, where he was the voice of the Anteaters basketball team. <laughs> Started in sports like myself. Very interesting. And uh, host of the Freedom of Voice talk show on KUCI-FM and received his law degree from Northwestern University, serving as editor of The Law Review. Today, he hosts Hidden Truth, a weekly series which dives deeply into the controversial and unresolved issues of our time to discover the truth, irrespective of politics, religion, or agenda. I'd like to welcome to the first time to Fade to Black, Jim Breslow. Jim, good evening. How are you? Good evening, Jimmy. Do you hear me okay? I got you, man. You are awesome. loud and clear. Yeah, you are well, a broadcaster. You got those pipes. We can add to my resume now and guest on the Jimmy Church show. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a, it's an honor to have you here. And you know, uh, before we get to all of that, uh, you get the first time guest disclaimer. So let's get that out of the way, which is it's just you and I, Jim sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends, and where the conversation starts, it starts, and where it ends, it ends, but we're going to end as friends. There you go. You ready to Are go? Are supposed to have cocktails in front of yeah, us? Yeah, well, what? see, that's what we do when you're a guest in the house, chilled vodka. Absolutely. <laughs> well, see, th this, is, this is what I find uh, fascinating about you. I've gone back and 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 listened to all of your coverage on this, and you had a very – you know, successful law career and, and Patton and, and Las Vegas and, and, and the gaming, you don't need to be doing what you're doing today uh, when it comes to the Las Vegas shooting, and I respect that. But take me back. What led you here to being such an, uh, an advocate for the truth? Was it the law career, or was this something that you had always done but never had a chance to cover? Yeah, well, I appreciate you asking. It, it, it's a lifelong passion, as I think you may have had the same lifelong passion for broadcasting, frankly. I mean, I grew up listening to shows like, you know, Art Bell's Coast to Coast and so on. So I just always had a love for talk shows, a desire to do it. I used to broadcast the, my Little League games from my shortstop position. So if I had a father who really taught his child to pursue his dreams, uh, I would have been doing it my whole life. But instead, I had a father who had determined that uh, one son was going to be a lawyer and the other was going to be a doctor and I was chosen to be the lawyer so it was my duty uh, to go to law school and then you know once you get into law school the next thing you do is naturally you know you practice law because the law firms are throwing a lot of money at you uh, even though I was not sure I wanted to do that but I did that and uh, ultimately was successful made partner at my law firm but I still was itching for something else so I always dabbled I kept one foot in broadcasting at, at all times so that's when I had the Jim Breslow show uh, which was kind of a late night Night, late night, coast to coast type of show uh, in Los Angeles. Then when I left the firm to do uh, the gaming business, which was kind of a slot machine company and also lottery equipment, I kept one foot in broadcasting by doing the casino talk show. And then when the company was bought uh, about a year and a half ago, I finally had a break, kind of traveled the world, enjoyed myself finally. And then when I got back, it's like, okay, what's going to be the next chapter? And I thought, you know what? Maybe it's finally time to return to my original love of broadcasting. So that's what led me to start the Hidden Truth Show. Now, let me, uh, I've, I've just got to ask you, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here in, in Southern California, and here we all know the Anteaters. Okay, so, <laughs> Matt, it must have been the coolest gig being in college, being the voice of the Anteaters. I mean, how cool is that? Well, uh, not only that, but they actually had a pretty good run at that time. So people of, of my age that may remember the UNLV run in Rebels with uh, Jerry Tarkanian right. during their height when they won the championship. Well, believe it, you know, Irvine would play them twice a year. So I got to call the, uh, the Irvine versus UNLV games. And believe it or not, we actually knocked them off. 
uh, at the Bren Center in Irvine. We had knocked off the number one team in the country. And I got to coin the phrase at the end, Jimmy, do you believe in miracles? Yes. Anteaters win. <laughs> Anteaters win. So, yeah, I, Michaels took that for me. Uh, yeah, he took that for me. Yeah. You know what? Well, you know what? That That's an honor and a privilege right there. See, the thing is this. I I think all broadcasters, whether you're in talk radio, and we've seen a lot of talk radio guys try to uh, go and and do play by play and do color commentary for sports, because secretly that's what we all want to do. I mean, that's a tough gig. It's fun, and when you're good at it, it's it's like the ultimate. And I mad mad props to you. Um, it, with uh, uh, you know Vin Scully or or Michaels or any of these greats that are out there, uh, it, it it's such a talent. But the talk show guys, they they really know where it's at. It's not in talk. It's not in talk radio. Yeah. You know, we Have all, you ever done it? Uh, you see, okay, that's what, and I, you know what, this is what talk radio guys do. They will sit at home. They'll turn the game on, turn the volume down. And try to be Vin Scully. That's what they do. That's, that's what they do when they're alone. And I did that a lot and, and tried to practice that. In, uh, when I was uh, studying broadcasting, that was one of the things we would do is, uh, I mean, like required stuff. You get all your notes in front of you and you put up the play-by-play and you do... Uh, the voiceover for the sports stuff, for the different donuts and the different loops uh, that you would do. And it's hard, man. It is a hard, tough thing. So, well, no. You know, it, 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 I, I mean, it really came naturally to me, I, I have to say. I mean, I listened to so many freaking games when I was a kid at the earliest possible age, just constantly listening to games on the radio. I was just an absolute sports nut. So by the time I was in college and doing that, it, it actually kind of, it kind of came pretty naturally to me. And one thing I noticed is just how much better you get with repetition. Yeah. Like each game, it just became more and more natural. So for a guy like Vince Scully, who was at it for 60 years, I mean, for him, it's rolling out of bed. And, and I think for most of those guys, it, it, it gets to that point. Now, with uh, you today right, and with you hosting and you've done a lot of radio, um, how how much of a challenge is that for you in that Every show is is better than the next one, right? Are you are you comfortable in your own skin today? Yeah, getting more and more comfortable because you know I hadn't done a show for a while, so it's something that you know you have to kind of get used to and get comfortable with. And what's going to be your style and this and that? Obviously, you want to be yourself as as much as possible. For me, the, the, the show that I'm doing is really an interview format show, long form interviews, which which is really my passion. I just have a natural curiosity and just love talking to people and interviewing people, as I'm sure you do, and so. That, that's my passion, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little rusty at it when I came back to it, but getting better and better. And, um, you know, as far as the Hidden Truth show, uh, you know, that was really a choice made from seeing the mainstream media and their absolute obsession with everything Trump, whether you're on the pro or the anti side, it's this obsession and big, important issues not getting covered and issues getting covered always from one side or the other. I mean, you can't figure out the news today unless you watch both Fox and CNN or whatever else. But if you watch any single one of those, you're getting half of the story. So you, you got to watch both. And it's just an insane reality of our media these days. So I'm trying to be the genuine voice of the truth where I don't care where it leads, political correctness be damned, uh, religion, politics, doesn't matter. The truth is what matters. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a dangerous uh, zone that we find ourselves in, both as uh, uh, I'm on one side where I'm a broadcaster, and then we have the audience on the other side, which is in treacherous waters wherever they're wading into, and we don't know where the truth lies anymore, and it has gotten more and more polarized. It's getting 
the the different media outlets out there are getting more and more extreme where they were they were always sort of extreme to the left or to the right or whatever whatever you know their their broadcasting platform was but now it is it is just taken off to the so far uh, left or right and it doesn't matter what the subject is no it's, i think that you know ethics used to play a big role in journalism and there was always the money element but there was the ethical standards and i think that the money as often happens now has become far more important than the ethical standards well and that's why the las vegas shooting to me is the ultimate situation for a journalist and i said this from the first night that uh the shooting happened here is an opportunity for real journalism to happen because you are given all of the tools. You know that the Las Vegas Police Department and law enforcement and those agencies were holding back information and were not giving us the truth. And so go at it. You have you have the opportunity here to go and get to the real truth and present it to the country. And to this day, as far as mainstream goes, it hasn't happened. Yeah, and I think you had some things working against you in Vegas. Um, you've got a, a city that really didn't want this in the news. This is not good for business. So MGM certainly didn't want it in the news because arguably they are partly responsible for this, uh, but also as a hotel casino company and all the other hotel casinos company, this is not good for business. Las Vegas police, they bungled this thing from the beginning, so they didn't want it in the, in the, in the news. And then the, the media uh, seems to kind of be beholden to the casino interests. You have Sheldon Adelson, who owns the Sands, Venetian Palazzo, who owns the Las Vegas Review Journal. So you got that conflict right there. And you got the fact that, um, you know, they're beholden on, you know, it's like, the Hollywood press that covers Hollywood, you know, they, they don't entertainment tonight doesn't tell you the real truth about what's going on in Hollywood because they're dependent on Hollywood for content. And, you know, it's the same thing with the media, I think, in, in Vegas. Now, what do we know? Let's uh, let's start with uh, facts, if, we, if there are any facts. Uh, if you know what I mean. Uh, okay, so what do we know as fact? Uh, and we'll start with the date. We know that the shooting happened on October 1st, 2017 at about 10 p.m. in the evening. Okay, so that we, we know that. What else do we know as fact when it comes to the Las Vegas shooting? Well, most of the facts that I'm going to share with you, I'm getting from the police report. So you just need to start right there and understand that take it all with a grain of salt. This is coming from the police report. Now, the police report from the Las Vegas police is a very extensive report. There was a preliminary report that came out in about March. And then about a month or two ago, a final report came out. And anybody can see it online. They can see it on our website, hiddentruthshow.com. Uh, we're talking about about an 80-page report and lots of footnotes and in, in, in supporting documentation. So in talking to people who have reviewed police reports and so on, they describe it as a pretty thorough uh, police report and, and, and frankly well put together, perhaps one of the few things Vegas police have, have done well. So we've got a police report that's got a lot of facts in it, and I think that for the most part, it's a reliable report. Now, the uh, the shooting happened on October first, and and Stephen Paddock. I, I want to start uh, to pick this uh, stuff apart now. Um, and one of the things that I found very suspicious was nearly immediately after the shooting, the hotel room. Uh, crime scene photos were leaked. And I, I had said very publicly back then, Jim, that the police department and all of the agencies that are involved know who took those pictures and know who leaked them. And if they don't do anything about it, then they were leaked for a reason. Well, that's exactly what happened. Right. And th th we s we still don't know officially who leaked the photographs, but they do. Were those photographs leaked on purpose? 
Uh, I don't have the answer to that. And, and what's interesting is very few people are asking that question. That That is not one of the outstanding questions that a lot of people are asking about. So that's going to that's gonna remain a mystery at this point. And why do you think that is? Why do you think that there isn't uh, any mainstream journalists out there that are willing to take this on? Um, you know, I think the, 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 the word is that the mainstream media in Las Vegas is afraid of the police, that they're afraid they're going to be shut off of from information from the police, and so that they're very reticent to criticize the police. But what about uh, okay? But yeah. what about the New York Times or CNN or Fox or the Washington Post or BBC or RT rolling into town? I think that a lot of this stuff for them borders too much on the conspiracy side of things, and they tend to stay away from that. The mainstream media thinks of that as, you know, for a certain group on YouTube and on the Internet and so on, and that's that stuff is kind of beneath them to pursue. Um, you know, and I'm, I consider myself not a conspiracy theorist, although I am someone who is going to dig into the conspiracies. But, you know, I found that, um, you know, I had been a guest on some shows, and then they, they didn't want to have me as a guest anymore because they thought that my show was getting too conspiratorial. So that'll tell you how much the mainstream media is keeping arm's length from anything conspiracy, especially now when you see Alex Jones getting kicked off of things. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's causing the mainstream media to run even further away from any of that type of journalism. Well, and here we have the opportunity. If you If you don't want conspiracy theories out there, then have a real press conference and, and tell us the truth. But as long as you hold back, we're going to go out and, and try to figure out things on our own. And that's where the conspiracy side comes in, because the Las Vegas shooting gives us every opportunity for extreme thoughts. Yes, and the bungling from the beginning has fed the conspiracy theories because you think, well, gee, why are the police coming out with three different explanations as to what happened to Paddock? Why are they coming out with three different explanations as to the timeline? Why are they suddenly not releasing information? Now, you could take that to a big conspiracy theory and fit that into all kinds of different conspiracies, or you could chalk it up to police incompetence. <laughs> and before we go there, I mean, I was questioning uh, the the timeline aspect of this where things weren't just lining up. And then the videos that were showing up on YouTube, which seemed to be lined up accurately with the gunshots that were happening and the timing of things, which wasn't lining up with what the police had publicly said. Well, if, if you don't come back with another police... Uh, press conference explaining the discrepancies, then who's right here? And I think that was a big issue. Yeah, that's where Lombardo really was horrible. I mean, he, he, he wouldn't just come right out and acknowledge. He would come out with a new timeline and pretend it wasn't a new timeline. And the press are kind of like listening to him up there explaining things They're like, um, but that's not what you said yesterday. And it's just rolling off his tongue as if nobody should pick up the fact that he's just totally changed the story from one day to the other. So there, 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 there's a problem with this guy. Uh, he got reelected in the middle of this, which is just unbelievable. The Las Vegas Review Journal endorsed him even though they're one of the organizations that had to sue him in order to get him to release information. And they finally had to go to the Nevada Supreme Court, which finally said, Las Vegas police, stop screwing around and release this information. You've provided no basis to not release all this information and finally ordered Lombardo to release all this information. And, and he released it all in a big F U way because he just started dumping the information, no context, no explanations, no table of contents, just dump after dump after dump said, oh, you want it, media? Here you go. No press conferences, no nothing. Just unbelievable how horrible it was It was um, presented. Now, when we come back after the break, you happen to get the amazing scoop. You interviewed uh, Stephen Paddock's brother. You were the first person to do that. We're going to talk about that when we come back. 
Before we get there, uh, I hope uh, everything is okay there. That sounded strange in the background. <laughs> that was a door. Okay. It wasn't anything we need to be alarmed at. <laughs> I'm still here. Okay. Um, but uh, what happened with that hotel room on the 32nd floor? Can people stay there? Great question. Uh, I've got a sleuth reporter in Vegas as we speak, and you know, obviously everyone knows that we're we're, we're doing this on the one year anniversary. So there, there's lots of events going on today, and it's a very solemn day in Vegas and day of remembrance, obviously. Um, but yes, you can. He actually went to the room and confirmed that for me today, and and, and took video of that. A um, couple of interesting notes: they did change the floor numbers, so. It's no longer the 32nd floor. It's the 33rd. Yeah, I think it's like 56th floor. And it used to be room 135. Now I think it may be room 235. So they kind of rotated that a bit. Uh, But, yeah, you can, as as eerie and creepy as that sounds, yes, you could rent that room out. You know, I I am sure, just like there are people that proposed marriage to uh, Manson, right? I'm sure that there are people out there that want to rent that room well that's disgusting so i know i, 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 I hope what? it wouldn't be that type of person but yeah. but you know some of these I, I can tell you though some of these youtube uh, uh citizen journalists that have been doing a great job uh covering this um that is the type of thing that they may do because <laughs> they may want to be in there and do their own inspection because frankly it is quite interesting and intriguing to to see the view from those windows uh to the festival have you um, have you been in the room no no but I, obviously i've been to where the festival was and, and looked up at the room multiple times um and you know one of the one of the observations you have when you when you do that is like wow what a perfect place for him to commit what he did i mean it is really perched over that festival and those people at the festival were absolute sitting ducks let's uh take a break right here we need to get that out of the way our guest tonight is jim breslow host of the hidden truth show it is one year that's right october 1st 2017 20 years since the Las Vegas shooting happened. The the biggest mass shooting in United States history. We're discussing all of the angles tonight. We'll be right back after this short break. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Folks, this is very important information. What's to be said about CBD? AncientLifeOil.com. Our CBD is made from hemp and has 0.003 THC, which means this wonderful product won't get you high. No matter what amount you take, what does CBD do for the body? My hands are tied. But you can Google CBD benefits and be astounded. When you're finished reading, you'll want to log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com and purchase. Life is good when you feel good. People are tired of pain. People are asking for non-GMO organic products to help them with (laughs) <laughs> you fill in the blank. Legal in 49 states, and again, our CBD is made from hemp. Ancient Life Oil is about helping people one by one by one. If you wonder how good the product is, the CEO takes it every day without miss. AncientLifeOil.com. That's AncientLifeOil.com. Have a great day. Hi, this is Ray Sobbs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're, We're the Honey Brothers. Brothers. Well, the- <laughs> <laughs> yes. We are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution.
Reclaim your active lifestyle with Angioprim. Angioprim is the original liquid oral chelation supplement. Chelation helps remove toxins, heavy metals, and cholesterol in your veins and arteries that can cause blockages. Scientific research proves the active ingredient in Angioprim has superior oral chelation action that helps promote cardiovascular health. Find out more. Go to angioprim.com. Talk to a trained consultant by calling Angioprim toll free 877 882 7221. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official Fade or Not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hey, it's Grace. Can we talk about something serious for a minute? Your age. Getting old has its perks. But remember, being a few years younger... You know, your hair was thicker, you didn't have so many wrinkles, that extra weight wasn't haunting you, and you just felt better. Well, we can't turn back the clocks and go back 10 or 15 years, but you can start feeling and looking 10 or 15 years younger with Nature's Youth RSF. It's a doctor-formulated daily supplement that helps your body maintain its peak performance and fight the aging process. Imagine sleeping better, looking better, and feeling better. See how Nature's Youth RSF has helped thousands of people just like you at naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. Imagine how it will feel when your family and friends are asking you what you did to look so good. Your secret will be Nature's Youth RSF. It's time to start looking better and feeling better. Learn more and order your Nature's Youth RSF at naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only use night vision goggles from Bearing Optics. You can see your very own green chrome balls today by clicking on their banner at jimmychurchradio.com. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Jim Breslow. We're discussing, yes, it's been one year. It's hard to believe that a year has passed already since the Las Vegas mass shooting at the Mandalay Bay, which happened on October 1st, 2017. And, Jim, I want to break down, I want to start to break down some of the uh, ginormous questions that we all have here and uh, try to get to the bottom of all of this. And so we'll kind of start backwards and move forwards. But one of the questions that stays out in front of all of us is we're talking about 24 firearms, uh, a huge amount of ammunition, high-capacity magazines that were holding 100 rounds each, were all found in the suite, and we, you know, AR-15s, and it's just crazy the amount of firepower that was brought into the hotel room, which in Las Vegas, as you know, is one of the most monitored places on planet Earth. But nobody saw this happen, and you know, were Bellman involved? They didn't know. I don't know. These are heavy. Heavy suitcases, too. I mean, I, I, how how did he manage to pull that off? Yeah, well, heavily monitor certainly the gaming floor, right? But what we're learning is Vegas isn't as heavily monitored as, as we thought once you get off of the gaming floor. They like to keep a close eye on their money, but when it comes to other things, they're not near as careful. I mean, you got thousands of people, you know, streaming through these places, you know, count, you know, per day and so on, coming through the front door and the back door and, and roaming around. So, uh, you know, they, they don't have cameras, for instance, in the hallways of the of the floors. They don't have alarms, for instance, on the windows. You know, that was one of my first questions: is shouldn't an alarm have gone off as soon as he broke that window? Right. No alarms on the windows. We don't know what happened in the hallway because there's no cameras in the hallway. So it turns out Vegas is not as secure as we thought. Uh, Also, when you're a high roller, you get special treatment and uh, people don't look at you as closely. And when you want to use the service elevator, they let you use the service elevator. And uh, when you want to bring up lots of bags, uh, they don't question it. So yeah, we've got the video that shows 
um, the bellman helping him up with the bags. In fact, one of them shows that uh, Paddock wasn't even with the bags. He trusted the bellman to bring the bags up without him even with it. There's the bellman bringing them to, the, uh, you know, to to uh, up the elevator by himself. So, um, you know, you mentioned that I interviewed the brother, uh, Bruce Paddock. He says that this is not the first time that his brother had brought guns up into the Mandalay Bay. We also know that the Las Vegas police tell us that he brought essentially all the same weapons into the Ogden, uh, which is a condo building in downtown, just a week prior as he was scoping out the Life is Beautiful Festival. So he managed to get all the guns into the room there also. It's cra- it's crazy to think uh, 14 AR-15s. <laughs> I mean, it's just... It, it it boggles the mind that somebody was able to pull this off, and it's it's something that I still don't understand. And what you know when you when you get to Vegas, that's uh, especially as a first timer. That's what a lot of people do. They look up and and look at all of the cameras in the ceilings, right there. I mean, cameras seem to be everywhere, but in this case. It was it was just like the perfect storm, wasn't it? Nothing in the hallways, nothing obviously in the hotel rooms, no alarms on the windows. He just happened to pull this off, and he knew how to do it. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure we're going to get to some of this, and you know, that's to what extent Mandalay Bay should have been on higher alert. Um, there's a story that just came out, uh, I believe it was yesterday or today, by a guy named Doug Papa, who is a former police officer and has been covering this story very well. He says that there was an incident at Mandalay Bay a few years earlier where a guy was found with uh, automatic rifles in a room um, and arrested and other ancillary equipment that he had gotten up to the room and a scope and so on that it appeared that it was brought up to the room for the purpose of shooting down below. So Mandalay Bay, and this is according to the Doug Papa article, had been alerted in that sense. Uh, There also had been training that had taken place just a month prior to the shooting um, where they were training for the eventuality of somebody shooting from high up uh, in a hotel room and what would be the defense mechanism to that and it would be snipers. So they were practicing having snipers shooting from helicopters to two guys shooting, you know, from a hotel room. So this is something that was anticipated in Vegas that was known about. I mean, the possibility of terror on the Las Vegas Strip, please, we've all just been assuming when is this going to happen? We know it's going to happen eventually. You had 22,000 people at a festival directly across the street, easy target. What additional security did Mandalay Bay have in place in light of that festival going on across the street? I think we're going to learn through the litigation that's ongoing right now, zero, zero additional security. I I, I take it you're in your office right now. Yeah, I got some people uh, making a little commotion over there, but they're they're walking out. It, it should go away very soon. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Uh, the uh, that was for the audience, not for me. The um uh the so much was made of uh, again different conspiracy type situations. We have his 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 living girlfriend who apparently didn't know about any of it. I want to address this directly. Um, and her living outside of the country bought a, uh, he bought her a plane ticket right before. Um, how did she not know or, or what is to be made of that? Well, you know, the, she was originally a suspect or a person of interest I'm sure the FBI interviewed her multiple times. She did come back of her own free will to the United States from the Philippines and subject herself to those interviews, and she has been essentially cleared by the FBI, at least as of now. So uh, she passed the smell test for them. She did come clean to them and told them, by the way, gee, you may find my fingerprints on some of the bullets because I used to help him load his guns. Um, and I think, in fact, they did find her fingerprints on some of the bullets, but she had alerted them uh, to that fact. So, um, you know, she was the one that reported a lot of his odd behavior in the six months prior that he had been very distant, very removed from her, et cetera. She thought that he was sending her to the Philippines because he was breaking up with her. Um, so 
but she certainly was aware of all the gun purchases. She says that uh, he was a fanatic at certain hobbies, and he would jump from one hobby to the other. I think skydiving, believe it or not, was one of his hobbies. Uh, flying private planes was one of his hobbies. So uh, she just assumed this new hobby of collecting uh, rifles was uh, his, his latest obsession. Now, there. Now let's get into some other pretty strange uh, stories that surfaced. One, that this was a gun deal uh, gone bad. This was some undercover operation with the FBI, or maybe a foreign government was involved, too, as well. Or maybe Mexican cartels were... I mean, everything was put on the table here. And with the lack of the information coming from uh, the local agencies, it, it seems like maybe somebody was covering something up. Yeah, so I was kind of hot on that trail for a while, and when I say hot on it, it was it's something that was of significant interest to me that sounded like what could very well be an explanation. Again, some of these citizen journalists that you'll find on YouTube and so on were digging into it far, far more than, than I was, but you have a situation where the guy did seem to have an inordinate amount of money, uh, a lot of real estate, which is a natural place to kind of launder money. He's gambling a lot. That's another place that you launder money. He flies private planes. He's got homes in kind of random places like Arizona and Nevada and so on. Um, he's, he's got an inordinate number of guns. So all those seems to be pretty good circumstantial evidence that something else is going on here. Um, but, uh, you know, ultimately, one of my thoughts was like, you know, you're not going to do a gun deal in the Mandalay Bay Hotel. You know, if you're going to run guns, you don't run them through a suite on the 32nd floor. So that's where that theory kind of falls apart for me, because most of them, of those theories said that, yes, this was some type of a, a gun running deal and something went bad, something went wrong, who knows what. But that's why there were so many guns up there. And that that for me doesn't pass the smell test because I just think it's the last place you would pick to do a gun exchange. Well, yeah, I, I, I looked at that, uh, too, and my take is this, even though my take means nothing. But if you are going to set up somebody, and I'm talking about the FBI or some kind of sting operation, you would actually do something that seems a little bit dumb. Um, and, <laughs> and so for the criminals going, okay, yeah, let's do the gun deal at the Mandalay Bay, all right. Yeah, that makes sense. It's it's a public place. Okay, we could. It it actually for me has the opposite of uh, effect as to what you're suggesting. It would be the last place you would do it. Well, then that seems to me that's actually the place to do it. And yeah. um, if if you think about all of the uh, drug busts that happen in the middle of a parking lot somewhere where somebody is set up, you know, to come in and do it, and and it. It's like, man, what criminal is that dumb to do? So but there you go, right? Um, that that that's my take on it. Sure, and then you know, but but you know, if you go down that road, then you got to start putting the pieces together with that, right? So, okay, it was a gun run. Okay, who was involved in this? Who was he running the guns to? You know, where is the evidence of of, of that? You know, you need to start building that story and having those additional pieces fit into place. And I think that's where some of those pieces have at least not come to light yet and you also have to look at the fact as i said that he did rent out a room a week prior in downtown vegas at the ogden and bring all these guns up according to las vegas police all the same guns were brought up to that room and there was a music festival going on there he also according to google searches had been searching uh, Lollapalooza in Chicago and also had rented a room out there overlooking that festival. He also supposedly searched Fenway Park, Santa Monica Pier. So that seems to point in the direction that this guy intended to do a mass shooting. Now, when you interviewed his brother, Bruce, uh, did you... Uh, I do want to talk about that. It was uh, an amazing... Uh, thing that you happen to pull off and you were first uh, in doing so. Uh, did you get a motive? Yeah, he, he uh, <laughs> uh, uh, too much hookers and blow. That's that's the quote from the brother. Uh, now, wh wh what does that mean? 
you know, I think what that means is he was kind of not fond of his brother. They actually hadn't spoken in about 10 years and uh, really didn't think much of his brother's lifestyle. Um, Eric Paddock, who did a couple of big uh, interviews outside of his home in Florida, kind of, you know, the very next day. Those are the interviews that most people have seen with Eric Paddock. The one I did was with was with Bruce Paddock, um, who was living in Los Angeles at the time and, and facing child pornography charges. Um, Eric was, was kind of close with the brother. In fact, he had investments with him. Bruce wasn't close at all. And I think, frankly, was kind of just a little bit disgusted by uh, Stephen Paddock's lifestyle of kind of opulence and just not caring about anybody. Um, and, um, you know, gambling, you know, frittering his money away, gambling, spending it on hookers. And apparently that is kind of confirmed that that he was known for getting hookers. In fact, there was three women registered to the room that we still don't know much about. But the assumption is that these were prostitutes that he had uh, put their name and registered them to the room. So uh, his theory would basically be that um, – you know, he lost all his money gambling. He did mention IRS debts. That's something that hasn't really come to light yet, but might come out in the FBI report that's coming out by the end of the year. I think we may learn that he owed some significant debts to the IRS. So he had all this piling up and, you know, you've you put that with a narcissistic personality who's used to being treated as a VIP and so on. He's realizing this VIP lifestyle is going to come to an end. Well, he's going to go out with a bang. Now, do you think I don't I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on Bruce, but the story was pretty big here in Los Angeles. You you live in Los Angeles and you know how, you know, the the Bruce Paddock part of it was covered here on talk radio and and local media. But it, do you think uh, it, he's he's in jail now? He was homeless, right? He was bouncing around a different retirement homes or had a weird situation going on and was caught with a laptop that had uh, child pornography on it and is is he in jail so no he escaped the charges i think the charges could be brought back but there was a statute of limitations issue with them and the issue was how many pictures were found if it's under a certain number of pictures then the statute of limitations is much shorter if it's over a certain number then it becomes a felony and the statute of limitations is longer and the issue was how many pictures exactly were found and they had a witness who uh, they had problems with and i believe what happened was the witness failed to appear for the trial and so the police had to essentially dismiss the case against him and he walked free um, but I think the case could theoretically be brought back against him, but most likely it's it's done. So now he is still uh, living in assisted living in Los Angeles. Uh, he had a major, major back operation uh, recently, and he is recovering from that back operation. And he believes that, that his brother Stephen had similar back problems, and I think he was getting that from the mother. And he speculates that they that may have also played a role in it, that that uh, Bruce Paddock or sorry, Stephen Paddock was had deteriorating health. What about the uh, let's let's move to the multiple shooter uh, scenario. Uh, I've seen all the videos that everybody else has of the Mandalay Bay with uh, what appears to be gunfire coming from different floors, not all from the 32nd floor. Uh, where do we stand today with that? Yeah, well, we're probably going to be in the same place today as we'll be 50 years from now. And, and just like with JFK and, you know, how many shooters were there in JFK? You know, this is going to be one of those that's going to last a long time. And one of the reasons is that you have so many eyewitnesses that absolutely swear that there were multiple shooters. And if you talk to them today, they're still going to say that there's multiple shooters. So, and there's a number of different things to talk about when we talk about multiple shooters. So, you know, the first is the 10 minutes of shooting, right? How many shooters was it really during this 10 minutes of shooting? So, and, and how many floors was it? Here's what I say. Only the, the windows of only one room were broken out. Okay. You can't shoot through a window without there being bullet holes through the window unless you're a magician. So we know based on that, that the shooting only came out of that one window as far as shooting from Mandalay Bay. Was the shooting coming from some other direction? 
if you ask anybody who was on the ground, they would say absolutely that gunfire had different sounds to it. Uh, it seemed to be coming from the strip area. Uh, it was sounded like more than one gun at a time. There's no way it was one gun. I was hearing the bullets coming from this direction. This person heard it from this direction. But you've got widespread panic. You've got echoing happening off of tall buildings. You have a sound system that is not turned off. So this sound system, when Jason Aldean runs off the stage, that thing's still picking up the shooting. So I think that's the explanation as to why people thought for sure that there were multiple shooters. I mean, it was just so many bullets. But, you know, when you go back and you count and you see how many bullets were fired from that room, and I don't have the exact numbers, but it's about 1,000 or 1,100 rounds mm -hmm. fired, and how many people were hit – and that number is about 480 people were struck by a bullet. 58 died by the bullet. So that means that almost 50% of the bullets that he fired actually struck someone. That seems to pass the smell test as being him hitting 50%. Yeah, that probably sounds about right. So um, in that sense, the number of people hit versus the number of bullets fired seem to support the idea that it was just paddock as far as those 10 minutes. We now, can talk more about those 10 minutes if you want, or then we can also talk about after those 10 minutes. Yo, we'll, we'll get to all of that. Um, the video that shows the gunfire from the sixth floor window with the flashes, uh, how do we explain that away? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure the precise video you're referring to, but I certainly know that there are multiple videos out there showing reflections happening on, on different floors. And, you know, I would just go back to, okay, is that window busted out? Are there bullet holes in that window? I just don't think that if there were, that could be somehow uh, concealed from the public. Now, so uh, what about more than one shooter in the room? Yeah, so um, that appears to be conclusively determined to be one, and here's why. You do have the body cam of the officers finally going into the room over an hour after the shooting ended, and on that I'd be, love to talk to you about if you'd like, because I, I still find that to be very bizarre why it took the police so long to breach that door. But you do have the body cam, and you do see Paddock there on the floor. You have multiple officers noting that there was only one person in the room at that time. Now, how do we know no one got out? Well, that's from the lock interrogation reports. And by those reports, which are, you know, property of Mandalay Bay, they know when the locks on the rooms were engaged and disengaged. And according to that, they were last locked sometime in the nine o'clock hour, 943, something like that. And they weren't disengaged until the police actually breached the door. So no one could have gotten out of that room after the shooting. So that's what would seem to conclusively tell us there was one person in the room at the time of the shooting. So how do you, uh, I, I know you can deduce a lot from the police report, but how do you explain 1,100 rounds in, in 10 minutes? So that, I am not a ballistics expert, and, and to be honest, I don't think we ever actually have interviewed one for the show. Um, but I haven't heard. Let's put it this way: I haven't heard an expert say that that it's not possible. We do know that, of course, everybody's heard about the bump stock and that he was using bump stock, and that he had the bump stock on. You know, like fifteen of the twenty-two rifles had the bump stock on. So this, you know, they're all loaded. They're all ready to go. Uh, it was explained to me that uh, one reason you would want so many rifles and all the bump stock is that with bump stock rifles can jam. So he was ready. If any one of them jammed, he's ready to pick up the next one. Uh, so that number of bullets in that period of time, I, I believe that that is doable in that scenario. And the uh, the ammunition itself, uh, were all 1,100 rounds of the expelled, you know, the shells, were all of those in the hotel room? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Oh, in other, the empty casings, were the empty casings all found in the room? Yes. Yeah, I, I you know I I'm assuming that's how they were able to count the number of rounds. Uh, do you mean as opposed to they may have fallen out of the of the window as right seeing? or found somewhere at at another location? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. It seems to ring a bell that maybe some casings were found, um, you know, down on the ground below the window. And there are so many uh, witnesses and uh, employees, casino employees, insiders that uh, have all said that the, there was there was action that was going down at the same time at multiple casinos. There were things that were happening. It wasn't just at the Mandalay Bay. Yes. So that gets very interesting. And that's what you still you, you start learning about when you listen to the 911 calls and some very compelling calls of, of hearing shots, seeing shooters. Uh, and this is going on all the way through the 11 o'clock hour uh, where you're continuing to get, I, th I think the number, uh, somebody did a nice job, uh, it goes by the name of Ron Burgundy, one of the citizen journalists, and we had him on the show recently. He did a nice job of reviewing every one of the 911 calls in the 11 o'clock hour. And he identified approximately 100 people calling in saying that they personally have just heard shots fired and we're talking about all up and down the strip uh, and you know police were dispatched to investigate uh, these shootings uh, this is one way in which I believe Las Vegas police have let down the public and all you got to do is is go to Vegas and talk to people that were there or are, are tuned into this and these people this is all so very raw and real to them still, and they're still convinced that there were multiple shooters, and the police aren't coming out and coming forward with explanations to say that, yes, we investigated this, 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 and here's what we found. Um, they've done a very poor job of answering what were these 100 call, 911 calls. Um, now, I would say on the other side of things, well, where are the bullet holes? Where are the people that were shot where is the evidence of these okay and then what's the explanation for them then i liking it to when we had a big earthquake here in, in los angeles 20 years ago and we had all these aftershocks and for a few weeks anytime a truck went by i thought we were having an aftershock it, we were just that used to aftershocks that any little rattling you're thinking aftershock my theory would be when you're in that mayhem of what happened in Vegas that night. And you have to keep in mind, this was not a 10 minute event. For the people that were there, this was a four hour event. They didn't know what was going on. It was sheer panic on the strip for four hours. So when you're hearing anything, people are thinking it's gunshots. They're hearing things that they're reporting as gunshots that may not be gunshots. And we're going to head towards a break, uh, but when we come back, we'll, we'll, we'll set this up uh, for after the break. The uh, again, once again, you know, just crazy video, but that video of the helicopter with what looks like muzzle flashes. What did you make of that? Uh, well, they what we do know is that a sniper was put into a helicopter to to attempt to take him down. Uh, the helicopter apparently. Uh, decided it, it could not get close enough for him to take a shot uh, because they're afraid of the shooter shooting back at the helicopter and taking the helicopter down. Is that true? Is that really? I hadn't heard that. Yeah, well, it, look, it makes sense. And that that is their training. That They've got snipers that can go up in helicopters. You know, it's not uncommon for Vegas to, to put uh, snipers out there. Dur during the uh, New Year's Eve festivals, when they closed down the Strip, they put snipers up there. At the Life is Beautiful festival that they did do this year, they put snipers up. The question could be asked, why weren't there snipers in place for this festival? So they had a sniper in a helicopter ready to take out Paddock, but they never shot, or at least that's the official. I Yes, I'm not sure I've seen an actual police report as to whether he ever fired or not, but the report that I saw said that he they wanted to fire they, they, they couldn't get close enough, and then presumably the shooting stopped because I would imagine by the time they were able to scramble that helicopter and get it up and get it potentially into position, the shooting probably it was close to having stopped by then. So it is possible. That's interesting. So it is possible that this footage of this helicopter shooting may actually be a real video. We just don't know if that helicopter was shooting or not, but it could have been in place to do so. That's incredible. 
Yeah, we'd want to check the time uh, on that if we've got a time code um, on that. But yes, you know, one of the original so-called conspiracy theories was that the shots were coming from helicopters. Well, we all know that there's always helicopters flying around Vegas, a lot of tourist helicopters and so on. And But we do know it is confirmed that, yes, police helicopters were scrambled as a result of uh, the, the outbreak of the shooting. Let's take a break right here. Our guest tonight is Jim Breslow, host of The Hidden Truth Show. It's been one year since the Las Vegas mass shooting. We're covering all of the angles tonight, finally, here on Fade to Black. I'll be right back. I'm your Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, The Planet. Stay with us. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRARadio.com. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzanel, tiburón. Y los invito para que escuchen mi buen amigo, Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires. This year we've experienced more than our fair share. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. And last month I decided to make sure my family does not have to worry about food should we get caught in a real emergency situation. Introducing Numana, a healthy, storable product that tastes so good that you'll want to eat it every day instead of just during those times of duress. All new Mana products have a 25-year shelf life, are MSG and GMO-free, no preservatives, and are made in America. With the new Mana pack in your home, you'll be able to sleep at night knowing that you've protected your family. Not only have I tasted and tested, I own it. Now you can too. Just click on the new Mana banner on JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code Jimmy when you order. In addition to a discount, we'll send you an autographed Fade to Black t-shirt. Seriously. Go back, Lee Tappy. Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. <laughs> KGRARadio.com If you have hard water, the lime scale not only leaves white spots, it clogs pipes and breaks down appliances, costing you hundreds of dollars in energy and wear. Eliminate lime scale and other water issues like brown staining and bad odors with HydroCare water products available from Wave Home Solutions. Wave's affordable water systems don't use salts or chemicals. You'll love the way your water tastes, smells, and looks. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? you love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is revolution. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao.
Welcome back. Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Jim Breslow, host of The Hidden Truth Show. And we're discussing the Las Vegas mass shooting one year later. It happened last year, October 1st, 2017. It is October 1st, 2018. And, and Jim, I, my email has been flooded uh, with uh, photographs of broken windows all over the hotel. Um, and they're just coming in. I'm just uh, 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 going through these now. Are you suggesting that these are all photoshopped um, and there was only uh, his room and his room only? I have never seen any a police report about additional broken windows. So, um, you know, photoshopped or taken at a different time or um, I don't know. I'd have to see the pictures, but... Uh, there's certainly been uh, no official, let's put it that way, who has ever come out and verified that, yes, there were additional broken windows. Hmm. Yeah, I don't don't know. I I don't know what to make of it. It's 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 all just so interesting to me. Uh, The you know, do we chalk this up to fake news, which is something I want to get into right now. Uh, the the fake news uh, thing that happened uh, through 2016 and 2017 was something that we all, and yourself included, have been dealing with it, trying to figure out what is real and what is not. And then this happens on, on October 1st, and now it's an opportunity for everybody out there to to post. And that's what happened with Facebook and forums and, and websites and YouTube uh, with the Las Vegas shooting. Yeah, and I think that's awesome. You know, it, it, where citizen journalists are taking the place uh, to some extent of, of real journalists. And, um, you know, I think, you know, any effort to quell that by the YouTubes of the world should really be frowned upon. More information, the better. And uh, to, to, you know, the, the, it shouldn't be possible for there to be conspiracies anymore because they'll all be exposed by citizen journalists. And 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 how do you how do you approach this uh, when you're looking at different reports out there from uh, citizen journalists and and alternative media versus what is being presented by the police and and mass media? Uh, how do you figure out what's real and what is not? Yeah, great question. I mean, I take it all very seriously, and I think that the citizen journalists, I don't think that they are intentionally misinforming. Um, I think that they've got a lot of questions that they're trying to find answers to, and they're throwing a lot of bits and pieces of information out there. Um, I think some of them fail, however, to really connect the dots into a cohesive theory that that, that works, that makes sense. You know, it's, it's putting together a, a puzzle. And you need all the pieces of the puzzle to fit together for it really to work. So I think a lot of them have a piece or two here or there, but ultimately I haven't seen anything where the pieces of the puzzle come together in a way that causes me to think, oh, wow, this is what we've got going on here. Now, things could still come to light. As absurd as that sounds, being a year out, more things could still come to light. We still don't even have the FBI's report out. The FBI is is giving us every indication. They think that they're going to be able to announce a motive here. So we're all waiting for that report. uh, Let's talk about the distance now, too, as well. And I know that you've uh, been down to the area where the concert was, uh, where you, you have the opportunity to turn around and look at the Mandalay Bay. Uh, what what are we is it well I guess it's possible but the velocity from that distance uh, to to have this kind of uh, uh, destruction and death happen is is it possible is does the velocity hold up uh, well I, I think that it's, it was about 430 yards uh, was the distance if I have that correctly. I was just seeing a report again. This was another Doug Papa report. I highly recommend reading his stuff. Um, and he was talking about um, that the, the, the distance of the shots. But, um, you know, you probably have read that the only handwritten note they found in the room, very odd that he didn't leave a note, uh, but the only note that was found was coordinates, supposedly, to help him determine that, that trajectory. 
And, you know, it is known that he was very adept with, uh, with guns. His brother told me that it was very common for him to go to shooting ranges. Uh, I believe the girlfriend said the same thing. So this guy had turned himself into a bit of an expert. The um, uh, and as we as we look back at this, it, it, it has been a year. Uh, what are your conclusions? Um, well, I, I do think that that even though there's outstanding questions that need to be answered. I think ISIS is, is an interesting one um, that needs to be answered. Uh, but right now, I would be going with the lone shooter acting alone. Uh, you know, the family thinks that he is was fully capable of doing this on his own. Uh, the theory would be that he had been losing and starting to lose big. His uh, lavish lifestyle might be coming to the end. Maybe the IRS is coming after him. He perhaps was suffering some, you know, psychotic episodes or depression. The father was on FBI's most wanted list, was a known psychopath. Uh, Paddock did not have a relationship with his father. Uh, his father was a bank robber. Paddock is out trying to beat the so-called banks of Vegas. And when he couldn't do it, he decides, I'm going to go out notorious nonetheless. There was a prostitute that was interviewed that said he liked to refer to himself as a bad man. I'm a bad man. Well, maybe he wanted to go out as a really bad man. In fact, the worst man in the history of mass shootings. And perhaps that's why there wasn't a note. Well, you know? yeah, I, I, the, my issues with all of that, if uh, if it is a lone shooter, and, and you've got one guy, you've got the crime scene, you've got the weapons, you have his identity, you have his body. It is the easiest thing to figure out in the world, and it's like an open and shut case. Why wait 10 months uh, for a police report and, and this big investigation if it is so simple to figure out because you have everything? Yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, I've definitely been scratching my head on this FBI report and why it's taking so long. But, you know, we, we've seen <laughs> another FBI investigation taking uh, forever. We, we know that the FBI is very methodical, very slow. They track down everything. There were some interesting reports, and I'm not going to get the numbers correct as far as the total number of FBI agents that have worked on this case, the number of field offices that have been touched, the number of international offices that have been touched because Paddock traveled internationally. What is all this investigation about? I think it's primarily about terrorism. You know, that is the FBI's involvement in this. They're, they're acting as a supportive role to the police, uh, but they're also looking for ties to terrorism. Now, they've come out twice and flat out said, we don't see a tie to terrorism. Uh, so you could ask, well, you know, how are you already saying that when you haven't completed your investigation and what are you investigating? But, um, you know, Paddock did travel quite a bit internationally. Uh, there was some reports of, of some funds transfers that he had done that um, allegedly had triggered something at a bank that caused them to close an account uh, as a result of, you know, it appeared to be possibly, you know, funding of terrorism. Uh, overseas. Um, you know, he had a lot of cash to track down. So, you know, I think they're tracking down every lead. You, you know, don't forget, we had ISIS claim responsibility. So I would hope that they're tracking down that link, even though they came out very early and said no ISIS link. It appears, uh, I mean, to anybody looking at this, Jim, that this is a cover up. That's it. It, it. It's a cover up. They're, they're, they they blundered it from the beginning because they were trying to figure out a way to cover this up from the beginning, and they've been struggling with that sense. I don't have another explanation. If that is the case, what is it that I, I, it could be ISIS? Uh, and I don't I, I don't want to let that go. We can continue with that. But uh, what is it that they would be covering up? Incompetence. I think that's my best answer to what the cover up was, at least for Las Vegas police, because one of the things that was covered up was the fact that Las Vegas police were on the 31st floor for approximately four and a half minutes listening to the shooting one floor above. Did anybody get that indication from Lombardo's initial press conferences when he got the timeline wrong 
three times. Did he ever come out and say, oh, by the way, we were there. We had two officers in position that could have intercepted this. But sorry, public, one of them froze on the 31st floor. We didn't learn that until after Lombardo was reelected. And we learned that through the release of body cam that showed the officer with timestamps freezing on the 31st floor. That was covered up. And there's, uh, I want to stay right here for a second. The, uh, I'm a frequent traveler to Las Vegas. Okay, I've stayed, I'm proud to say that I've stayed and lost money in every single hotel there. And uh, I know what the police presence is like in Las Vegas. It's extreme. It's everywhere. And it allows everybody the comfort level of knowing that everywhere you turn, the police are there. So you have that part of it. The Mandalay Bay, and you have a concert going on. I, why would there be a delay uh, at all? Why would somebody be allowed to continue shooting machine guns out of a, a window into a crowd for 10 minutes? You would think that there would have been hundreds of officers on that floor within, within seconds and minutes kicking down the door and ending this thing. That's the part I have a hard time trying to swallow. Yeah, well, um, if this scenario ever happens again, God forbid, I think that you will have that scenario. I don't think that they were prepared for this. And with everything that we knew and should have known, I think it's shame on Las Vegas police and Mandalay Bay and MGM for not having thought about this particular scenario, considering that there's 22,000 people across the street, considering that Homeland Security had been there training them and advising them and ISIS flat out saying that Las Vegas is a terror target for them and to not consider the fact and be prepared for this possibility. I, uh, you know, shame on them. I, I think they should have been prepared, and now, and now they are. You know, it, it, hindsight's always twenty twenty, and we do this again and again. Uh, you know, uh, a guy w- wears a bomb in his shoes and tries to blow up a plane, so now we make everybody take their shoes off. You know, it's just we're always reacting to these things. It's hard to look back and find fault because hindsight is twenty twenty, but it does kind of seem that they should have had something more in place. As far as all these officers that you say that are that are everywhere, well, you know, what I've learned in some of this investigation is that the police really allows the casinos to police themselves. You've got a lot of off duty police officers that work at the casinos. This is how they supplement their income. So there's kind of an unwritten rule that police allow the casinos to police themselves. So There isn't as much active duty police on site as you would think, but there did happen to be two Las Vegas police officers on site arresting prostitutes at the time that the shooting began. And those are the two that did make it up to the 31st floor and listened to the shooting for four and a half minutes. Is it true that the MGM is suing victims? Yeah, it's pretty outrageous. And uh, as you noted, I have a... I have a law degree and I practiced for eight years and, and, and it didn't doesn't make any sense to me. It obviously was a, a legal maneuver to try to maneuver this case into the courts that they wanted. Apparently they wanted to be in federal court uh, and not in state court. And they found this uh, federal law called the Safety Act, which protects companies that create technology. It's a post 9-11 statute. And it was designed to protect companies that are trying to invent new technologies to protect to protect against terrorism from liability if it fails. Because can you imagine, you know, oh, I bought your technology and it didn't stop the terrorism. And now look at all these people are dead. I'm suing you for your product not working, product liability. So Congress decides that, well, we want to protect these companies. So they pass a law to protect them. Well, that's what MGM is trying to hide behind. They're saying that, well, we hired a security company to provide security to the event. And because we hired them, we are protected by the Safety Act from any claim of liability. So number one, I think it's an absurd thing to suggest that the fact that you hired security at this event protects you for everything, including what happened at your hotel. Number two, this only protects them in an act of terrorism So far, the FBI has said that it's not terrorism, even though Joe Lombardo 
sheriff and friend of the casinos, conveniently did call it terrorism, which helps MGM's case. doesn't help the victims, but it helps MGM's case. Uh, but then thirdly, the fact that MGM would initiate the case, sue their customers. They sued their customers who experienced this incredibly horrible event that they'll never forget and deal with for the rest of their lives, that they could be so callous as to haul them into court. These are people that hadn't even necessarily sued the MGM yet, but, but the MGM says that, well, we know that they had hired a lawyer or we had some reason to believe that they were going to file a lawsuit. We don't know if these people ever were going to sue the MGM. MGM sued them now, though. What and let's talk about that aftermath uh, when you have how many people were at that concert? The number you always hear is between twenty and twenty-two thousand. Uh, as far as there that night is a great question because I'm not sure I've ever really gotten a good answer to. Okay, that's the festival number, but you know it's night three. How many were actually at night three? So I, I'm gonna. If I were to guesstimate, I'm going to say it's something like 15,000. When uh, I've watched so many uh, videos, uh, it, it was it was hard to watch, but you have to to try to figure out what was uh, actually happening. And as you watch these videos, I questioned uh, the preparations for any type of emergency or exit, and it didn't seem like anything was in place there. What changes have been made? And what has the uh, MGM done to uh, make changes at the hotel? Hmm. Well, you know, the event was co-promoted by MGM and Live Nation. Um, and there was a lot of talk among the attorneys that were representing victims whether they were going to sue Live Nation or not. For, for sure they were going to sue MGM for allowing what took place at the hotel. Were they also going to sue based on what? took place on the festival grounds. And I think that's still probably yet to be determined, but I interviewed a number of the attorneys and they were kind of conflicted as to whether or not they were going to sue Live Nation or not. Um, you know, people were trampled. A lot of people, you, know, you know, I think approximately half of the injuries were not bullet wounds. They were, uh, you know, injuries suffered as a result of trying to exit. Uh, people, you know, had to tear down fences to get out. So, you know, an argument could be made that there wasn't proper exits. I have heard other people say that, no, actually, they thought that the exit flowed about as best as you could hope for, uh, given the circumstances. You know, the events going on, you know, it's interesting uh, for an event like that, you know, that you're guarding against people coming in, right? That's the primary guarding. Once the event ends, then you, you know, you open up all the exits. Well, this is an abrupt end in people trying to get out of exits that aren't essentially opened. So maybe there's something that could be learned um, from that. They, they do talk about the fact that, uh, you know, no one got on the, on the, uh, the, the uh, mic. Once Jason Aldean left the stage, there was silence. I mean, there was no emergency notification, no siren, no messaging going out, nobody telling them what was going on. Uh, it was just sheer panic. So that would be another thing that I would think in the future events would want to have something in place that if something horrendous like this happens, that there's still some emergency backup system. There's some place where a guy can get on mic and tell people what's going on or tell them what to do. So people were just left. Uh, on their own. Um, the MGM, what changes have been made at the hotel? <laughs> so when I visited the hotel, uh, when I first started doing my deep dive about three months after the shooting, I go to the elevator banks expecting to see tighter security. Uh, I see one security guard standing in one of the three banks, uh, the one that happened to be the one where, where Paddock went up. The other two banks, you could walk right in, carrying whatever you wanted, walk, walk right into the elevator. Uh, didn't even have the thing where you had to swipe your card to go to the room that you wanted to go. Right. Uh, so this is three months after and no apparent additional security at those elevators. Um, so I haven't heard of anything significant that MGM has put in place. You know, you've got this catch-22 that whatever they were to put in place would seem to highlight, aha, see, that's what you didn't have. Uh, in place. Um, there's been talk about metal detectors for bags. I don't think any of the hotels have put that into place. Um, the FBI did talk about 
uh, what they think needs to be done in the future and that there's so much focus on security getting into the event and screening and, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, electronic metal de- detectors and so on, but not enough thought put into the perimeter of the event, more of an outward facing security rather than inward. And, you know, what's really scary is, you know, this isn't doesn't just affect events taking place under large hotels. There's a lot of amphitheaters out there uh, where there's high ground above that amphitheater uh, where someone could carry out stuff like this. So I hope, I don't know what's going on, but I hope that all of these outdoor venues are looking at this and reassessing their security. Yeah, you can't help but, uh, yeah, I was in uh, uh, Las Vegas last month. And we were, uh, I don't want to say the hotel we were at, but, you know, we were at, you know, one of the big ones and uh, staying on the 30, I'd have to ask Rita, I think we were on the 33rd floor. And uh, and I'm looking out and I can't help but think of the Las Vegas shooting and I'm looking out the window and everything is just wide open uh you know these panoramic views and you're looking down at at these crowds of people and i going back to what you just said going up to our rooms uh all day long and all night we were never checked ever not not once and i thought these thoughts went through my mind multiple times yeah, I mean, it's hard, you know, what what do we want to live under? I mean, airports are a pain in the butt, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you, quite, you know, how much do people want to go through? People want to go to Vegas. They don't want to be thinking about security all the time. So I'm sure these hotels are very reticent to put in more obvious security and have people be thinking about this. You know, Vegas does not want people thinking about this. Sheriff Lombardo is very telling in his last press conference about a month ago. He flat out said, this could happen again. I'm like, wow, that's really kind of callous for the guy in charge of security of this city to just flat out say, this could happen again. But, you know, he's also being pretty damn truthful. And, you know, what does it tell you? I mean, it tells you people, you, you got to watch out. You got to keep your eyes open and be prepared because there's just no way to 100% guard against these type of things. Yeah, and the 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 one question that I have, I mean, when uh, now I may be the exception to the rule. We're going to be headed towards a break, but I, I've been to Vegas hundreds of times, Jim, hundreds of times. I check into my hotel. I'm there for two or three days. I got one bag, maybe two, you know, small bag, whatever. But when one person checks in with 50 bags <laughs> right, and 50 cases, that some bellman, somebody somewhere is going to say something to somebody, hey, that guy's got, you know, 150 bags that he's checking into his room. And they all weigh 100 pounds each. And they all clank like metal i mean but nobody said a thing i don't think i could get away with that but he did yeah well as i said he was a high roller uh he didn't bring them all up at the same time um but it is one of the astounding things and something where you have to think that they dropped the ball on because look bottom line the hotel has a policy against guns you're not allowed to bring guns into the mandalay bay okay why do you have this policy obviously you think that it's a safety issue okay so you've got the policy in place what do you do to enforce that policy how how can you tell us that you're enforcing this policy when a guy manages to get 22 rifles uh into his hotel room that sounds like you've got no enforcement policy now you could then say, okay, well, what should be the policy? How, you know, what what should they have had in place? Um, and yeah, I think that a bellman being a bit suspicious, you know, large bags. Again, today I'm sure they're all now taught. You would hope that they report something. And uh, you know, Steve Wynn had come out at the time and said that, oh, you know, if if the do not disturb sign is on a door for more than 12 hours, we go and we check it out and uh you know our maids are trained that if they see something suspicious in a room they're to report it so he claims that he had more things in place than mgm had but i think that level of alertness of the staff is what's required 
Yeah, and uh, let's take a break right here. And when we come back, that was another point that I I, I just don't understand. Uh, the maids are constantly knocking on the door and, and coming in and, and doing their things. Nobody for 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 days reported anything and weren't allowed in the room. It just seems like every red flag was raised, but nobody caught anything. Our guest tonight, Jim Breslow, The Hidden Truth Show. It's Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, The Mental Guard, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station. Salt Lake City, Utah. Van Buren, Arkansas. Poor water quality is a major health issue, and it's only getting worse. Municipalities can't keep up. Standards have dropped, and pollutants are increasing. Where does it all end? It ends by keeping the pollutants outside of your home with HydroCare's advanced systems available at Wave Home Solutions. No less than the best purification materials and processes have been developed by HydroCare to provide you with healthy, clean water for drinking, cooking, and showering. HydroCare far surpasses the competition in removing chlorine, odors, iron, lead, chemicals, lime scale, and much more. Don't settle for less when it comes to your water. We'll take care of the toughest water problems for you, whether it's from a city or well source. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, call 888-997-WAVE. That's 888-997-WAVE. Or go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. Your contact for current news and trending topics, KGRARadio.com. Does your basement or crawl space have a damp, musty smell? Well, watch out. That's a sign of too much moisture and not enough ventilation. And that can mean increased mold growth and the buildup of harmful toxins and gases. Don't bother with a dehumidifier. It just circulates the same unhealthy air. Now there's a better way to remove these dangers and odors. It's with the computerized Wave Moisture Control Unit that reduces moisture and expels pollutants. We replaced our old dehumidifier with the Wave unit, and in only three weeks, our basement is dry and the musty smell is gone. Wave units require no maintenance, no buckets of water or filters, and costs only pennies a day to run. Breathe better, live healthier with an affordable, no-maintenance Wave unit. Call 888-717-WAVE, 888-717-WAVE, or visit dryhealthyhome.com, dryhealthyhome.com. Right the way. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B blend. So are you tired of being tired? Well, then it's time to get the tea. Hey, it's Lisa here to tell you about this all-natural, all-organic tea I've been drinking that has had great results for over 20 years. It's called Life Change Tea, and it's specially formulated to help detoxify and cleanse your kidneys, liver, colon, and blood all at once. The colon is one of the most ignored organs in the human body. The faster that waste is eliminated from the body, the less time that waste sits in our intestines, spreading toxins to our bloodstream. This tea helps cleanse chemicals caused by outside intruders from our entire digestive system. And get this, weight loss can be a side effect. And with continued use of the tea, you can experience clear, healthier, younger looking skin, increased energy, and a happier outlook on life. So if you're tired of being tired, get the life change tea at getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. And like me, you'll be glad you did. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? 
Because you never got that pony, damn it! This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back, Fade to Black. One year. Today's October 1st, 2018. It's been one year since the Las Vegas shooting on October 1st, 2017. Stephen Paddock, 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay. Uh, 58 people uh, were tragically killed that evening and uh, eight, 851 injured. Uh, wow. Now, Jim, some of the, now I'm going to divert now over to some of the stuff that has been posting, uh, throughout Twitter, uh, on the show tonight. And one of them, okay, I want to visit this. If, uh, and this comes from Mark over in Australia, he said it's another case of lack of information. So people are going to jump to their own conclusions. Unfortunately, the official narrative is full of holes. And then I got a response from John saying, uh, well, yeah, and you can't get a story from a dead man. You just make it up. And th- that, it seems like an easy conclusion. It's almost like Occam's razor here. The lone gunman is dead, and it seems like the the narrative uh, has been made up along the way. And, and I, can't, I can't blame people for, for looking at it this way. Yeah, especially when Paddock himself left no note. You know, we interviewed a a lone wolf shooting expert, wrote a book about lone wolf shooters. And I believe the quote from him is he doesn't recall ever a situation of a lone wolf shooter who did not leave a note, a manifesto, some indication to tell everybody why he did what he did. Paddock went through a lot of trouble to do what he did and to not leave any type of explanation very bizarre yeah I, and the uh, illuminati symbolism that is everywhere on the net uh, uh when it comes to this uh what do you what do you what do you make of that i know that you've looked at at at, at a bunch of it well, uh, you know, I, I, Illuminati is not something that has been one of my uh, expertises or deep dives elements of this. So if, if there's elements that you want to point out to me, I could certainly uh, address it. But well, that I really haven't. I, we, we didn't have an expert on that. I'll, I'll tell you that. Well, you know, you have some of the obvious. Uh, it was called the Harvest Festival. Right. And and the numbers that are behind it. And I don't have a, a complete list of all of it, but uh, I, I saw it come up time and time again. And again, it's it's a just when we don't have the answers everybody's going to go out there and find their own. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, as I said, you know, there's going to be lots of pieces to the puzzle, but until you can put that, uh, those pieces into something that completes, you know, at least half or three quarters of the puzzle, um, you know, it, it, it's hard to go with that too far. Now, what about uh, the cell phone footage of the crowd uh, that appeared uh, to show shooters in the crowd itself, um, and and I know that you've you've covered this and you've looked at uh, the aftermath and what was going on in in the mayhem. It was just total total chaos on the ground there. Uh, what do we make of that part of it? Yeah, I mean, again, there's so many stories from the ground. Uh, we had a guy on who said that he found shell casings um, close to. Uh, I think it was outside of the Hooters, which is kind of next door to, to the thing. You know, That's what were right. shell casings doing outside of the Hooters? Um, but, yeah, so many reports of people seeing what appear to be gunshots. Uh, but, you know, you've got absolute mayhem going on, and you have a lot of lighting and a lot of reflective lighting and so on. Uh, so uh, th- th- that's still unexplained. Were there any shots fired into the hotel room uh, uh let's see in th- there were shots fired by the police uh while they were in the room so they breach the door 
Um, now they are, you know, not knowing what they're going to find. They see one man down, but they don't know who else is in there. Frankly, they should have suspected there was more than one person considering the amount of firing that was coming out of that room. Uh, then they breached a second door and that was into the adjoining room to the suite. So that had been locked from the other side. They couldn't open it. They blew that door down. And right after that, there were, I believe, three shots fired. And according to uh, the sheriff, those were negligent shots. So this was an officer who the door gets pulled down. Apparently he sees something. He lets off a, a rip of three bullets. Um, and the, and the, the sheriff Lombardo called that a negligent um, firing. So we don't know if he, they were uh, maybe there was a second shooter in that room and he was killed and we don't know about it. We don't know if that explanation is correct, um, that he did fire negligently, that he saw something that caused him to think there was something to shoot at. Um, but we don't know of anyone else who was hauled out of that suite other than Paddock. And what about from the street side? Did any police officers shoot into the window? No, uh, I've not heard of any shots being fired into the window. I mean, from the ground, I would imagine that would have had to have been very difficult. And by the time they actually identified where the shots were coming from, uh, you know, it really was this uh, security officer, Campos, who was the one who was shot by Paddock. This timeline was screwed up by Lombardo also. The original timeline had this, this security officer being the one that stopped Paddock from shooting. Well, it turns out the security officer wasn't even armed, um, but he was investigating uh, some rooms that had shown their locks had been uh, unlocked for an inordinate amount of time and just kind of stumbled upon the shooter, heard what he, he sounded like drilling going on, and he starts walking down the hallway, and Paddock, who had cameras facing toward the hallway through the peephole, sees someone coming toward the window and Paddock shoots through the door at Campos and hits him in the leg. Well, thanks to that, Campos reports that to Mandalay Bay and says, you know, I've been shot um, and I'm on the 32nd floor and it came from uh, room 115. Now let's 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 stop right there for a second. Let's let's back up. Uh, the, w w totally conflicting story from the word go. Uh, Campos versus what the sheriff was reporting. Now, who was in error here? Uh, well, I mean, obviously, I'm going to put in error the guy who, who reported it to everybody who's in charge of the investigation, and it's Lombardo. Now, if he had gotten some bad information and, and passed that along, you know, again, that's uh, I still put the blame on his feet because he, he should have been more careful about that. Uh, but, yeah, you did have this back and forth going on between the Mandalay Bay's timeline in the police's timeline. And at one point, you know, I told you earlier about how Lombardo was changing the timeline at these press conferences and acting like he wasn't changing anything. And Mandalay Bay or MGM themselves had to come out with their own report, kind of refuting what Lombardo had said and putting forth their own timeline of events. And, and how, look, I, I need to ask you directly, how is this even possible? It, it just doesn't make any sense. You would think that the communication is absolutely open and filtering through Lombardo and, and the Las Vegas Police Department so everything could be filtered and funneled and, and uh, collated, cross-referenced, and checked. And that apparently is the exact opposite of what happened. That doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, well, negligence and or cover up is the only explanation that I can come up with. And it, it may be it's a combination of those things. Um, but again, I, I think part of the cover up could have been the fact that he had these two officers in place uh, that did nothing. And he's been making excuses for these guys ever since. What he says about the fact that this officer Hendricks froze on the 31st floor and didn't move toward the shooter. Lombardo said in an interview, well, you don't bring a knife to a gunfight. And my answer to that is you sure as hell do. <laughs> when that guy who's got the gun is firing it down on a, you know, thousands of innocent people. 
Of course you bring the knife to the gunfight. You were sworn to protect and defend. And by the way, he didn't just have a knife. He had a gun and he had a bulletproof vest and he had a trainee officer with him who had the same thing. And he was with three Mandalay Bay security guards who were also armed. So they had a group of five sitting there on the 31st floor listening to Paddock killing people. Now, uh, before I get all outraged, there's another stat that I'm wondering if you have. How many, because we see it, you go to Las Vegas, you walk into a casino, every security guard has got a gun. What? How many security sta- armed security staff are, are employed at the Mandalay Bay? Mm, great question. Don't know the answer. However, Campos uh, uh, notoriously was not armed and there's speculation that oh well when they're not armed you you don't have to pay them near as much money so mandalay bay is saving money by having unarmed security guards now the okay you're on the casino floor and some lady gets her uh you know bucket of coin well it's not bucket of coins anymore you know everything is on tickets but (laughs) but back in the day you know if anything happened you get gang tackled uh because i've seen somebody try to steal a bucket and and i saw what happened to him within seconds it was pretty fascinating to see um and and that's the way it, but now we've got a shooter that is is shooting out of a, a hotel and it seems like the Mandalay Bay was reticent to do anything or to react to it yeah as we talked about before you know the the protection of people in rooms isn't near what the protection is and security is on the casino floor where all the money is so uh but you, you know look you have to uh, understand that you know you got to give people some level of privacy, um, and you can't have guards roaming around on the floors uh, all the time. And uh, but bottom line, security was in place. They did go up. Mandalay Bay security was deployed. The reports, as res- as a result of what Campos, what happened to Campos, and what he reported, they were deployed up to the thirty first and thirty second floor. There was actually two security guards that went to thirty two. And there was a three that went to 31. So in addition to that group I mentioned that it was on 31, on 32, you had in what they call the core, you know, that center area between the three spokes of the hotel. They were in that core area uh, listening to the shooting uh, also for three or four minutes. Now, I, I just got what I don't know what to make of this. this somebody's reporting a, an explosion at, in Las Vegas at the Las Vegas Memorial. Oh my God! Okay, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm going to try to, uh, to 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 to. This is at 9:02 p.m. Okay, so this is uh, 9:16. Very interesting. Okay, I don't know what to. Uh, I don't know what to make of this. I just I just Googled it myself and didn't see anything. Uh, Explosion at Las before. Vegas Memorial ended eight minutes ago. Two, two, two. Okay, maybe it hasn't hit. Uh, oh, sorry. I, I put in shooting. Let me try explosion. Yeah. Uh, oh my gosh! So then, Nevada Memorial Hospital is that? Uh, yeah, yeah. You looking at this here? Huh. Well, I want to make sure that before I say anything that I'm reading it. Yeah, Las Vegas Memorial right here. I, I have, uh, wow, what happened? 36 seconds in, explosion. Okay, yeah. Ah, ha. Okay, I'm going to, uh, this is uh, the beautiful thing about our audience, Jim, and the size of it and what happens in real time during this show. We will start to... I uh, get every, yeah here it's uh, all coming in okay KTVN uh, one dead Las Vegas strip resort parking lot explosion crazy yes man was killed another person escaped in an explosion small device uh, left the top of vehicle at Las Vegas strip report police say it's not a terrorist act They're calling it uh, okay wow. MGM owns the pyramid-shaped Luxor, so this was at the Luxor? Okay. So, wow. You know, uh, I'll tell you something, uh, Jim. Over the years, 
because of my broadcasting live each night, both here and over at uh, Coast to Coast, it seems like I'm always on the air when something happens, and I am forced into reacting to stuff live on the air, and I don't like it. Uh, the Pulse nightclub shooting, uh, Paris, uh, uh, you know, all of these things happened live when I was on the air, and and I, 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 I need to back off and try to figure things out as, as quickly as I can, but this stuff happens live on the air all the time. And it, here we have another event. And, you know, is this tied in? Well, you know, let's look at, you know, it's October 1st, right? I don't know yet, but uh, there you go. What are you finding out? You know what? I haven't been able to to, to find what you've seen. So I just pray that uh, whatever it is is uh, either misreported or if it is correct that it is unrelated to this because that would really really be sad and, and disgusting if, if in some way it was related yeah it's a breaking story right now this is channel 2 news out of las vegas is uh reporting the one dead uh at it looks like uh outside it looks like luxor and well, Luxor is, 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 you know, directly across from where the festival was. Yeah. They, they, wow. Now, that's not where uh, they may have done some type of uh, ceremony or were planning a ceremony. You, you know, we are uh, within an hour of the precise anniversary. And I know that uh, that lights were going to dim in Vegas at at. 10.05 uh, when the shooting began. So there's lots of events that were planned for the 10.05 uh, time period. Um, and there is a memorial, but the memor- memorial is closer to downtown Vegas, uh, not by where the festival was. But it wouldn't surprise me if they also had something planned close to the festival yeah uh we will uh maybe get to the bottom of this i don't i don't know what is uh what is going on now let's uh let's get back off of this and we'll see what happens at the break and i'll see if i can get some stuff together um the the research that you have done we have uh, 10 minutes left here jim the research that you have done as you start to plow through all of this and and try to make some sense of of what is going on uh what are your conclusions and i want to suggest one thing uh with with las vegas which is is it's a big city and it, it's a complex city but there has always been an underlying uh, political tone motivations that that stretch into the extreme. We, we're not going to visit that, but that the narrative was always control. They always control the image of Vegas, and uh, that may have played into this. What are your conclusions? Well, that's uh, why a lot of people speculate that any type of terror connection might have really been downplayed because the idea that it's a lone wolf shooter perhaps makes people feel a little bit better about it, that this isn't something that uh, that ISIS pulled off and is likely to pull off again. Oh, this was some random guy that cracked and you could never guard against that. And, you know, it's true. That does seem to excuse MGM perhaps a bit more and, and police, you know, how can you guard against the lone wolf crazy shooter um, as opposed to it being ISIS um, and the risk that ISIS could act again. Um, so, you know, as I said earlier, I, everything does seem to point to Paddock acting alone and having done this on himself, by himself and cracking. I do think that uh, there are a lot of theories out there that still deserve attention and follow up. I think that the ISIS connection is something that we didn't talk a lot about, but they did claim responsibility multiple times. And I've spoken to ISIS experts that say they do not claim responsibility without some underlying basis for it. It doesn't mean that they necessarily coordinated the attack, but that it was that they believe it was ISIS inspired. So apparently ISIS had some reason to believe that panic was inspired in some way to, to show support for ISIS. Um, Mary Lou Danley from the Philippines, you've got a heavy ISIS presence there. Uh, apparently her daughter, uh, it was discovered, uh, had a friend on Facebook who had posted uh, ISIS-inspired uh, videos, so you did have that slight connection. Mm-hmm. Um, but, 
you know, that's about all we have. You know, you also have the fact that ISIS was on the run. So a lot of people are speculating that, well, you know, ISIS central command is not as careful as they once were. And they were desperate for some type of attention. And if uh, if ISIS was involved, would that be part of a, a, a cover up? It, and what I mean by that is, is that enough to cover up because they don't want their investigation to be known? Right. Yeah. I mean, I would think that FBI and Vegas police would be very careful before they they gave ISIS credit for something. So I think they have every incentive to say that it's not ISIS and certainly from a political perspective and governments saying that, you know, we've got ISIS on the run and that ISIS isn't a problem anymore and that we've defeated them and the homeland is safe and everybody can feel secure to have a, a an ISIS attack like this would certainly not look good on the administration in power and and so forth as to how this was allowed. So I do think that it would probably be one of the last conclusions that they would want to draw, but for them to have come out and be so forward in, in the only twice the FBI has spoken on this, Aaron Rouse leads the investigation. He's spoken twice on this and both occasions he flat out said that there is, we see no terror link to this. Um, Still, though, raises the question, how do you explain ISIS claim of responsibility and multiple claims of responsibility? Okay, so I do have a tweet from the Las Vegas uh, Fire Department. Uh, This is the official Twitter. The Las Vegas Firefighters Local 1285 serving the city of Las Vegas follows for breaking news. Uh, 43 minutes ago, explosion at 1200 South 4th Street. Uh, explosion near block wall E4 will handle with IDAS so there you go and that's from their official uh, Twitter feed so uh, wh- where this uh, and, and where this is going I don't know but we'll wait for other media reports to come in but that's where everything is stemming from this official tweet from Las Vegas Fire Local 1285, 42 minutes ago. Wow. Well, Jim, thank you for for all of your amazing coverage on this. Where can everybody go and listen to the Hidden Truth Show? Thanks, Jimmy. I really enjoyed it. Appreciate the time, and uh, you know, love to do it, especially on the anniversary uh, of, of the shooting, and uh, to pay respect to everybody who suffered there and, and continue to s- seek answers. Uh, it's the Hidden Truth Show. Uh, it's a podcast, so wherever you listen to podcasts, Hidden Truth Show, and then we also have a YouTube channel where you can check out some videos that we put there. And uh, we're also onto a new deep dive that we started recently into the transgender movement. So the whole show is about finding the truth behind controversial and unresolved issues of our time and uh this transgender movement fascinated us so we're doing a deep dive into that also now and twitter uh yep hidden uh hidden truth show on twitter facebook uh instagram uh youtube and we have your website links up too as well did i see and those are over at uh, jimmychurchradio.com did i see that are you making a documentary is there something else in the works uh, no, uh, but uh, th- we, we did have somebody on the show. He's done a documentary about his name is Ramsey Dennison, uh, what happened in Vegas or happens in Vegas. And he did something exposing police corruption in Vegas. Uh, so you may have gotten confused with that. And now I know that he wants to follow up with an additional documentary about the shooting. But this is going to be quite a uh, movie, uh, documentary and or movie one day. You know, that Versace movie just won an Emmy, I saw. And uh, those are the same guys that did something on O.J. Simpson. Th- th- this story about the shooter and his upbringing and the father who was a bank robber and so on and, and what led to this, uh, this is going to be done as a movie someday. Well, my, my take uh, Jim, and we can kind of part on this. When you have something like this, if it's just a lone gunman, then it's all very simple. If it's anything beyond that, and uh, the true word of a conspiracy is more than two people you know, committing a crime, and conspiring uh, to do something illegal, somebody is going to slip up and something is going to get exposed. And I just have the feeling uh, deep down that there's something more to uh, Stephen Paddock and what actually went down there. And maybe one day we will finally get to the truth. 
I had the same feeling. That's why I started doing the deep dive, uh, but we still haven't found it. Thank you so much, Jim. Be safe out there. Thanks, Jimmy. Jim Breslow. The show is The Hidden Truth Show. We have the links up for it over at jimmychurchradio.com. You can go and uh, visit the website and check everything out. Thank you so much, Jim. Fascinating conversation tonight. I'm going to go ahead and uh, go to open lines like we always do right about now. I'm going to take a quick break, and I'll be right back with your phone calls. Stay with us. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires. This year we've experienced more than our fair share. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. And last month I decided to make sure my family does not have to worry about food should we get caught in a real emergency situation. Introducing Numana, a healthy, storable product that tastes so good that you'll want to eat it every day instead of just during those times of duress. All Numana products have a 25-year shelf life, are MSG and GMO-free, no preservatives, and are made in America. With the Numana pack in your home, you'll be able to sleep at night knowing that you've protected your family. Not only have I tasted and tested, I own it. Now you can too. Just click on the Numana banner on JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code Jimmy when you order. In addition to a discount, we'll send you an autographed Fade to Black t-shirt. Seriously, go back Lee Tappy. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I take Life Change Tea supplements every single day. It's what I do. Click on their banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go back, Lee Teppy. Hi, folks. CBD is the home run hitter for health right now. Why, you ask? Because of what it does for the body. Unfortunately, I can't tell you all about the benefit. You know, there's reasons. Do your due diligence and log on to AncientLifeOil.com. That's AncientLifeOil.com. Ancient Life Oil uses organic ingredients and is blended in coconut oil for some of the best benefits. Legal in 50 states and non-psychoactive. Log on to AncientLifeOil.com. That's AncientLifeOil.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and my family is safe because of Numana Emergency Food Storage. Just go to the Numana banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Promo code Jimmy10. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com Absolutely. 
This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Great conversation tonight with uh, Jim Breslow. One year after the Las Vegas mass shooting at the Mandalay Bay, Stephen Paddock, 50, 58 people died that night. 851 were injured. 1,100 rounds fired. 15 AR-15s, uh, 26 weapons I have no idea how much ammunition was up there. One of the things, uh, I'm going to get to the phone calls in a second. One of the things that was uh, brought up in Twitter tonight that I'm fascinated with, because I haven't fired that many guns in my life. I I have. But uh, the, uh, uh, the amount of smoke that must have been inside of that room, can you imagine uh, I, I don't know if they're, you know, would, would he have a mask on? How how do you see out of the room there? It's, you know, 1,100 rounds. I, I, I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't uh, uh, claim to be any type of a weapons expert, but uh, that, that is something that was brought up tonight. Yeah, can you, the smoke must have been pouring out of that room. Let's go to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? Good evening, Jimmy. How are you, sir? Hey, Eric, how are you? Remember Soltech? Uh, I, I, I would if you speak up a little bit. Can, can you hear me now? Uh, there you go. Okay. What, okay. okay. I, I, I can't, uh, Eric, you're fading out. you got to speak into the phone. Uh, my mouth is right up to the phone. Okay. Okay. Let's try this again. Okay. What about Soltech? No, I'm just saying I literally just got home from Soltech. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, but yeah. Are you I, I got a I got a story to tell you about the Vegas thing and I didn't I it was one of those kind of things that happened. Brad Olson was there and John Polk was there and I, I was really too nervous to even discuss it on any radio show or talk about it like publicly. But since it's been a year now, I could tell. This, I feel comfortable to tell the story. Okay. Uh, so we were out there. We were at the Five D conference. Brad Olson was speaking. Uh, Clyde Lewis was there. John Polk and I went out there to check it out. And so I stayed at the Motel Six because I had my cats. And that's like two blocks away from where the shooting was. And uh, you know me, Mister Curiosity. So I had to ask questions. So I was asking some of the, the ladies that cleaned the rooms there. I said, you know, this shooting that happened here, did, did you guys hear anything? Or what, did you, what did you know? Or I'm trying to get some information. Then one lady told me that she said her and a couple of the other people that worked at the Motel 6, there was a van that was parked in the back part of the parking lot there. And that they said that the, and this was not like they were trying to tell me the story to impress me. I had to kind of drag me out of it. They said that they saw a man in some sort of a gear, like army, whatever, you know, like some sort of uh, gear, the clothing gear, the protection, whatever, and run into this van shortly after the shooting and take off. So I thought that was kind of suspicious. And so the next morning, I took my iPad and took a little drive out there. I was going to, it was only two blocks. So I went around the corner. And they had the road blocked. Even even it was like a month after the shooting, and and they even at that point you could not drive into or around that area. It was totally secured. So I pulled into the parking lot where Hoons was, which is right across the street. I pull out my iPad and I start periscoping live, but I'm not putting the camera on where the shooting was. I'm completely the opposite direction over there at the Hooters, and so I'm just kind of scanning. And I was probably 10 seconds outside my car, scanning. I go to the right, and all of a sudden, the cop pulls up in the driveway, and I'm still recording. And he says, what are you doing? Why are you over here recording? You know, he starts questioning me. And I said, I'm just a tourist. I'm just taking pictures of the area. He goes, you need to shut that off, and you need to move on. So I, so I looked down, and I turned it off, and I got in my car and drove away. And I went back to the hotel, and I said, I wanted to, I was excited. I was, you know, I just ran me out of there. 
And so somehow between that moment and the time Okay, we got Eric, back to the hotel, Eric, I got to jump in. You got to walk into the best room in the house with reception, man. You're fading in and out. All right, bro. Okay, now I got you. Wherever you are right now, do not change. Okay, so you get back and you look, and 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 what happened? The Periscope video, and this is bizarre for me. It was literally deleted, and I'm not making this up. It was it was there. I I know I recorded it. I looked at it afterwards. I went back to the hotel to tell Brad, and it was gone. It was completely deleted from my broadcast. I thought, how can that happen? But all I'm trying to say is there's a really strange, eerie vibe there. And then later that night, we went to Hooters at the bar, and the waiters and the waitresses would not talk about it. They even had the most nervous look on their face, like they just would not discuss it. So they were obviously warned. So I just think something strange went down there. Above and beyond one man in a tower shoot people. That's just my personal opinion. Right, right. Yeah, out. yeah. I hear that's very interesting. And Eric, thank you for the phone call. I'm so sorry that you're fading in and out. But uh, you know, if you get another, uh, if you get another uh, uh, bar or two added, uh, let us know. Let's uh, go back to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? This would be Brendan. Jimmy, how are you doing? Hey, Brendan. How are you, man? I'm doing uh, okay right now. I want to tell you that Spoon's doing all right. So uh, the Spooner dog is absolutely uh, doing well. I wanted to ask two different questions, if I can, from you tonight. Sure. Okay. So uh, two different things. Um, there really has not been any news from since when you did this. I mean, probably about years and years ago now. But uh, any new news about the underground water base? Uh, no, uh, we, um, uh, not, well, not anything, uh, conc- I mean, if I had something, I would, uh, break it on the show. Cause I know about the show that's going on and whatnot, but I mean, uh, anything, I mean, anything that we don't know about. <laughs> I don't have, I mean, I'm, I have to ask you, dude. I, I know. have to ask you. I mean, and come on, enough. man. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I went back and, you know, we did uh, uh, our our TV show, uh, which aired uh, uh, two or three weeks ago on, on History Canada. Channel. No, it, it aired here in the United States uh, three weeks ago. And I went back oh, okay. and I went back and no, watched it. Well, I didn't I didn't get it for um, uh, maybe my my cable was different. I don't know. It, it must be certain different uh, companies. So. Uh, no, it was on History Channel, but it does. That part doesn't matter, uh, Brandon. What I'm saying is, I went back and 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 watched that, and the I this is what I if if I had anything to say about that area, I think that they have something that runs interference Underneath under the it. water. Yeah, I do. I do electronically because. We, um, I can, I can talk about this now. Now that the uh, show yeah, is yeah, now aired. that it's over, you can talk about it. Right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, and it, it, every single time we got close, our sonar uh, got interrupted, and it was really, really strange. Yeah, and the sonar ran fine at the surface, you know, but once we got. Uh, you know, a few hundred feet once into you, the once water. Once went down like a certain amount, right. like then it then would go off or what? Yeah, it did. And, yeah, okay. And we we never uh, we never figured that out. And I believe that uh, uh, other attempts that have been made to do the same thing that we did, uh, the same interference was run. So and and you have to remember, there's a, a, a navy installation there. There's a marine installation. No, there. I know. I yeah. I'm I'm not. Yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. I yeah. Know. So you said you had two questions. What was the other one? Okay. So the other question would be uh, for this year because of uh, October. Do you think we're going to bring Shaw back for one more day or not? Oh yeah, of course. Shaw the oh, Moon okay. Witch. We're, we're going to bring Shaw back. All right. Yeah, of course, man. That's my favorite. She That's is one of my favorite. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, she is absolutely amazing. Now, uh, did you uh, did you talk to Shaw uh, this year or last year? 
Um, I did not. I sent her a message, but I never got a, a response. Oh, okay. I, because I've often wondered with uh, our audience um, that has had uh, a reading from Shaw on the Halloween specials that we if, do. If, if anything ever works. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It, because uh, certain people say it works, certain people say it doesn't, but... Uh, no, because actually pretty much every year that I've done that, and then actually the year that uh, we we did the priest as well, I remember, because you have to remember, I've been I've been here the entire time for a uh, fade of black, so, uh, so basically, yeah, uh, no, I've never actually gone through for any of those. Now, what do you, did? it's been one year since the uh, Las Vegas shooting, um, what, what, what do I think about the Las Vegas shooting? Yeah, what what do you think? Um, here's here's the thing that I really do think. I I do think that it it there was something set up there. I I don't know what it was. I don't know how it was, but it had to have been somewhat of an inside job. I I don't really want to say that because then I'm gonna get yelled at or somebody's gonna say something. I'm like you know I'm wrong with something, but. There has to be something because I I truly feel that it, it was an inside thing. Yeah, and uh, the I mean the the lack of information from law enforcement and certainly waiting ten months for a police report on a lo- on a lone shooter doesn't make any sense for all of us. And well, that- hey, we obviously know there wasn't there wasn't a lone shooter. There had to be another shooter. There had to be. I mean, because if you look at the directory of the bullets, I mean, why? How could you? I mean, I don't think so. I mean, that's. I mean, I'm pretty good at shooting, but I mean, like, I don't shoot that often anymore. But I mean, like, I'm just saying, it, the trajectory. Like, it seems like there was more than one shooter. Is is all I'm saying. There was a lot of, lot of, lot of. Uh... 1,100 rounds fired. It just seems like... Yeah, to, to, and to people were crazy, off. right, Jimmy? So, Well, uh, you know, and 10 minutes, okay, so it's 100 rounds a minute. That's not much, but if if you have automatic weapons, but nonetheless, you have... Uh, you, uh, you get physically even tired. Semis, I mean, even semis, though, you can literally do that. I mean, it's possible. I mean, it's hard, but it's possible to do it. No, but wouldn't you physically get exhausted? Yeah, yeah, you physically would get exhausted. Exactly. Yes, you would. Uh, I mean, I mean, your shoulder, your shoulder would hurt. Your, your arm ha- would hurt. Your you trigger like, finger. Hey, no, I don't want to do that anymore. Right, and you got to hold the weapon up, you know, unless. It, yeah, exactly. You know, and then you've got to physically reload a uh, hundred round magazines. I mean, how much do those weigh? And you're lugging those uh, around and, a lot, yeah. a lot. I mean, they're I, I I don't remember, but I would have to say like at least like something along the lines of like a twenty pounds, like something along like fifteen, maybe twenty pounds. Like when you pick them up, like and you put them in like the gun. Yeah, probably something like that. I yeah. mean, they're heavy. They're not like light. And I would have thought that somebody out there would have gone to a gun range and shot a video of trying to shoot 1,100 rounds in in 10 minutes, right? What, what, Nobody physically, could do that. Yeah, physically. Nobody could do that. I don't, I don't think anybody could do that. That's the thing. Like, I mean, you, you ask anybody, like, I'm pretty sure... No, I don't think that's possible. I mean, we we can try it. I mean, I don't. I mean, I'll try it. But I mean, like, I don't think it's possible. Yeah, you know, I, you you wouldn't do it with one weapon. That's for sure. That thing would just overheat. I would think oh, it, would, not, it would it would break. It would blow back. I mean, you have all kinds of problems. So it then, would definitely you, not. So yeah. you, you'd have to set the weapon down, get another one, and and bring it up, get ready, exactly. and so you, exactly. That's exactly what you would have to do. I mean, I mean, like Las Vegas. I mean, here's the thing, man. Like, I was supposed to be there two days after when that happened. I was going to be there because. Uh, there's a few fights, and I mean, I mean, you, you know, we've talked about this before, Jimmy. But uh, like, what, like, so I'm a certain writer for certain things, and I'm not gonna say anything else. But um, so basically, yeah. So there's this thing, and then all of a sudden, I just couldn't go because all this thing happened in Las Vegas, 
And so I wanted to be there, but I couldn't be there. And then here, here's what sucks, right, is if you have friends in Las Vegas to where you want to go say hello to, and, like, uh, you already said, hey, you want to go over there and you want to say hello to them, and then you can't go there anymore because, you know, there's some shooting. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it, it, it's a little weird. It's a little weird, man. It's, it's not exactly uh, It's not exactly fun. Thank you so much, man. I'm glad Spoon is... Uh, how, how, uh, how big is she now? Oh, dude, she's, uh, she's the same size, but she's, she's passed out on top of my, uh, my Raiders bed. And the Raiders won today, so... <clears throat> so, there you go. Hey, did the Dodgers win? Yes, they did. Wow, the Dodgers won. So the Dodgers won uh, the NL West. Yes, he well, yes, yes, that's what happened. Yes, they did, sir. And so now, uh, you know, I'm not into uh, sports. No, the, hey, well, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry that your Cubbies lost, dude. I'm sorry, Chicago lost, <laughs> but you know, I mean, I'm I'm sorry, dude. But I'm Milwaukee. Like I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna be okay. Okay, there you go. Brandon, behave and be well, and uh, give uh, Spoon a big hug All for right, us. Make sure, you, hey, make sure you give the the girls a big hug, and make sure you uh, like. Hey, just make sure you're good, man. Like, uh, you know, I, I love you guys. So goodbye, man. Thank you, Brandon. And uh, we um, rescued uh, a puppy, uh, which was uh, probably two years ago now. Was it three? We rescued a puppy, had her here. And uh, Brandon stepped up and adopted her and named her Spoon. And she was unbelievable. And that day uh, that we were taking, we had a, a gift uh, bag and stuff put together for Brandon. And, and Rita and I were driving uh, o- over the hill uh, to Brandon's house. And we almost turned the car around. <laughs> we almost... Turned the car around. She was unbelievably beautiful. Well, all puppies are, but she was unbelievably uh, beautiful and special. But uh, uh, Brandon uh, adopted her, and he is really, really cool. And there you go. So for those of you that weren't around back then, that's who Spoon is, and that's who uh, uh, Brandon is. Now, oh, okay, so uh, phone, I've, I've got time for one more phone call. I've, I've let everything go. Uh, three two three two five five zero four five or two seven five nine six nine five. Back to the, the Las Vegas. Uh, the the points that I want to make about this is that the changes that were made, and Jim Breslow and I touched upon this tonight. The changes that were made on YouTube, in in a very general aspect, started. Right then with the Las Vegas shooting and the videos that were being posted on YouTube and the there were things that were happening a little bit before that the censorship was starting to happen. We felt some of the weirdness that was going on in alternative media and the presentations on on YouTube. But when the Las Vegas shooting happened and all of these disclosures were happening rapid fire on YouTube the censorship started and the changes started on YouTube. And and I want to express this. If there was uh, one thing that happened with the Las Vegas shooting, it was YouTube and censorship. And the, the other things that um, I, I didn't bring up tonight, but the other things that were going on at the same time were uh, the the gun control uh, narrative that always comes up with something like this that that happens. There was that aspect of it too as well, and and the Second Amendment rights. There's that part of it, and that also had a huge influence on YouTube as well. And some things stayed up, and some things didn't. And I found that very very fascinating. The uh, the other part of, uh, about this. And, and we can't uh, dispute that. We have the day before the Las Vegas shooting, and we have the day after. You know, and clearly YouTube was another world before the Las Vegas shooting, and it was another world after. And we can definitely draw the line right there. And the... Uh, 
uh, the not only the videos, but the eyewitness testimony. Uh, we have the direct videos that were being put up by people. There's that, and the news reporting that was happening on 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 YouTube about the Las Vegas shooting. There's that, but then there's the other part. The, it's all of the cell phone videos, the cab driver, the famous cab driver video. This stuff all went up on YouTube. That's where the real reporting was happening at the time. You couldn't get anything on mainstream media outside of what the official narrative was coming from the uh, the press conferences. And I was watching the press conferences. I'm watching and reading all of the alternative media that was happening. And the the stories weren't adding up and they weren't making sense to me. And it, it, it seemed a little bit strange. And then everything started getting pulled from YouTube. And the censorship was up. You know, and the community guidelines suddenly and those enforcements were happening. Let's go to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? Hey, Jimmy. Hey, who's this? Yes, yeah, J.K. from uh, New York. Hey, J.K. from New York. Yeah. Hey, I, I just got a quick state or question uh is it correct in assuming the police determined that it was a one they, they didn't give any details they just said it was a one shooter incident what do you mean at the time or now or or now yeah well i think uh the official police report that was released in august right a month ago uh you can go and you can easily access it uh at hidden truth show uh, so you can go there and and see it the uh, well, I just, the official anyway, yeah. the the official statements, uh, and I have it uh, the basic outline here, uh, which states that it was a lone shooter. Oh, I, I was just wondering about the ballistics reports because if it was, it, wouldn't that show all the, all the ent- bullet entry wounds would be from an a- high angle, and, and none were from level ground. Oh, you're talking about uh, with uh, everybody that was in the audience at the concert? Yeah. Yeah, that I don't know. This is what we have. Uh, On August 3rd, 2018, Las Vegas Sheriff Joe Lombardo held a press conference on the release of the Las Vegas Metro Police Department criminal investigative report of the October 1st mass shooting. He said the 10-month investigation had revealed no evidence of conspiracy or a second gunman and that the gunman's motive had not been definitely determined. Lombardo said, and I'm quoting here, what we have been able to answer are the questions of who, what, when, where, and how. We have not been able to definitively answer is why Stephen Paddock committed this act, end quote. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, they'll, they'll never give you the the whole report. Is what I'm. Yeah, I guess is what I'm trying to say. You know, they, because you think people would say, "Hey, you know, the guys that, that did the autopsies would say, why are these bullet wounds?' You know, different or different bullets, different. right? And and yeah, yeah, but, um, absolutely. Well, J.K., thank you for that. And okay. I've got I've got to roll yeah. out of here, but uh, thank you for. Yep. You know, we, okay, we, Jimmy. We just Have thank you, night. you too, J.K. We just haven't gotten the answers, and uh, I'll say it again. I, I keep going back to the same thing that fascinates me: twenty-four firearms, fourteen uh, AR-15s. And not one bellman unzipped a, a suitcase to to steal a Rolex watch, right? <laughs> I mean, that's and I'm not. You know what I'm saying? Nobody unzipped anything. Nobody, oh, you know, nobody, nobody, nobody knew. And I just it 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 just doesn't make any sense. I would love for somebody to just come forward and go, yeah, man, I, I suspected something, but I didn't say anything. I suspected something. I said something to somebody, but we just let it go. You know, say that, but the, the absolute dead silence of this and just saying that it was just a bunch of mistakes all in a row. That's the part that I just don't buy. I don't. So maybe one day we'll get to the bottom of what happened on October 1st, 2017. Right now, all we have is the official story. 
lone gunman, and we don't know why. He happened to get all of the stuff up there. We don't know. He made millions of dollars. He was a high roller. We don't know how he got away with everything. You know, oh, and the one thing I didn't mention, uh, the ammo dealer that sold him all of the armor-piercing bullets, he was arrested last month. I didn't get to that tonight. Maybe I'll visit this tomorrow. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. I got to thank Jim Breslow for coming in tonight. Absolutely fascinating conversation. And, of course, his show is The Hidden Truth Show. Beta Black's executive producer is Rita Camarion. The show is produced by Hill J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Spaceboy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and syndication is KGRA, The Planet. It's broadcast on and copyrighted 2018 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Until tomorrow night, Chance Gardner, Magical Egypt, right here. I want everybody to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.